also tweet out Like a, the, the thing, you know, the thing. No, I don't know. It's not the thing, because then people will think we're talking about John Carpenter's The Thing, which we are not. Although there are similarities, such as being out in the snow and a monster and stuff. Okay. The burly man, all right. The burly man. I mean, we're going to have to live up to that, you realize. I'm not sure. I need to somehow measure. I feel like I might have given myself too much of the screen, but it might be an optical illusion. So let me find a way to measure Oh, people are saying that they cannot hear you. Good, good thing that I did that. Uh, just chatting. Okay, so we want there. Now, if Casey says something. Hello. People should be able to hear that. It's probably too loud. They'll probably complain that you're way too loud. A bit loud. Okay, I'll turn it down a little bit. Okay, so the distance here, I'm using an envelope and a pen to mark out the distance on the screen. Yeah, I, I was greedy and took too much space, as I'm told men always do in the modern society. All right. All right. I'll also invite Let's, you to a squad stream in case that makes any sense difference oh at all. We can own some noobs. So the one game that might be interesting to play but might not is Among Us. I don't know if you've seen that at all. I have not. It's like a ten player game. It's like it's like if you took Werewolf or Vampire or one of those, but actually made a game where people are wandering around trying to do it's like, you know, it's like the thing actually, or like there's crew on a spaceship and two of them I are see. aliens. And it, it could be fun, but you need like 10 people to play it. And I don't know how that works. All right. All right. So I think the only other thing I need to do is I feel like much like you would have the situation. I feel like they won't. Uh, I just lost you again. Your, your audio is now completely silent. It's like Nadine's drapes in Twin Peaks. It's completely, after she puts the cotton balls in, it's completely silent. Hey, John. Yes. Can you say something? I'm trying to 
trying to find my mouse so I can make my text bigger. Looks, I think, I think we're good now. All right, I might have to adjust your levels a bit once we actually start, just to make sure I have those correct. But I've been taking all my proper medication. My levels should be fine. Here goes nothing. Here goes nothing. I cannot find the mouse that I usually use for the laptop. I might have left it in Austin. Rip. 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 I feel like you're the kind of person who often leaves things places. You know, is that, a, is that a fair, would that be a fair assessment? Okay, I was going to send you and Jeff a while back a screenshot of an Amazon page, which I, I did not send. Okay. Um, the Amazon page is all the times that I've bought Edematic ER4P headphones. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe I'm up to seven now, but one of them is a backup pair that's in the cupboard. So... This working it literally uh this is so lame every time i switch resolutions on this thing every time it, it switches the thing back okay i think we're good also how do we lock this down so other people can't join our meeting i don't know i mean if nobody else has the link they probably can't right um, well, they can't join, but it would pop up an annoying little, do you want to let this person join? Although maybe... I don't think I would see that. Yeah, I'm I probably wouldn't either because I created it from a different machine. So I think we're probably good. Okay, I'm looking for your squad stream. There we go. Invites. Accept. We are now in a squad. Oh, hey, look. There's uh, there's uh, X13. Hello there. How's it going, George? Can everyone hear me? Can anyone hear me or John? Yeah. How is my volume on my end as well, chat? Is it good? Does Kate, do, like for our volumes to match, really, what has to happen? Yeah, and I think I, I need to move this a little There's closer, a probably, for optimal okay. noise freeness. This is the absolute first time that everyone has said the volume is okay. In the history of mankind. Someone says John is 90% of Casey's volume. All right, I'm gonna turn Casey down a hair, but I don't know how to make Casey 90% of his current volume because it's decibels. So like, uh, you're, you're at minus 4.1 decibels, so I'm gonna make you minus 4.4 decibels. I'm also going to fix a few things here because uh, I think we may have a channel issue. Where's the Someone little... Someone says density is a little off. I don't know what that is. On a mono. I don't know what that is. Hey, hey floor is lava. Is that any better? All right, cool. All right. Uh, then I'm going to go take a quick... I'm going to just go grab like a water and stuff right before on. we start. Yeah, but otherwise we'll be almost on time. This probably will just crash and burn in five seconds because yeah, easily. I mean, us be us actually starting within a within ten mm. plus or minus ten minutes of the start time. Uh, okay, it'll be like the TV show. Yeah. All right. I'll be right back. Hopefully, we'll see what happens. All right. Well, I will have a discussion with myself now about all these exciting things.
camera really is standing up to having the image big. However, we are only pulling down the image from the camera at 1080p, and I believe I could do 4K if I set it up right. But we're not going to worry about that right now. We're going to leave it on 1080. We're going to leave it on 1080. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of camera? Is it? It's a Sony Alpha 7 III, which is the most ridiculous model number. It's more ridiculous even than computer model numbers. And the lens is, I don't know, it's some lens that I got. It's probably not the best one for this scenario. Uh, but it's better than a webcam. I had a pretty good webcam, and this is way better than a pretty good webcam. It's not new. I've been using this camera ever since uh, early this year. I forget when I hooked it up. I actually bought it last year, but just was lazy for a while and didn't plug it in. And then I finally did. And I'm glad I did. It's a good camera. What software do you use? None really. I have a, a Camlink 4K with an HDMI input and you just plug it right into there and then Windows sees it as a capture device. All righty. All righty. Well, sounds, like, sounds like we're good to go. Are we good? Okay, great. I think so. Well, thanks everybody for stopping by. We'll uh, see you next week. No. <laughs> I think we should quit while we're ahead. Yeah. I mean, all of the audio visual stuff is like nominally working right now. I feel like that's our cue to yeah. kind of end it while we still can. Yeah. Well, we, so Casey and I decided, I guess a while ago, how long ago did we decide to do something like this? It was like last I, year. It was on your stream. Like we were on your stream discussing like a tech thing. Like, I don't know if it was the water one or if it was the one like before that, yeah. but we were just like, we should talk about a movie sometime. Yeah, I, I have really weird. So I've known Casey for a long time. Um, I don't remember when I first met you. I want to say it was like 1998, but it was like a glass. I think that's about thing. right. It was, it was like, 97 or 98, yeah. I was visiting Chris at the Definition 6 office in Seattle, and you came <laughs> yeah. in to grab something. That was like yeah. the first time yeah. I think that I met. Anyway, but I've, I've known Casey, you know, pretty well since, you know, well before Braid came out, right? Like 2006, 2005. Actually, I knew you well enough. I remember when we were shutting down Bolt Action, and I was telling you, how I was going to be in debt for a long time. You were like yeah, well, disgusted with what I was saying or something. Like I didn't know how to, anyway. So I, so I, I also well remember enough. like, I remember like Baron Habermeyer or yeah. somebody was your, yeah. Like, yeah. I remember all of this just very vaguely. So that was vaguely. like 2000, 2001. Okay. So anyway, so my memory is that I remember having some conversations with you way back then about us agreeing pretty solidly on some things, right? But then lately, I don't feel like that's the way it is, right? Lately, okay. I feel like we have pretty divergent viewpoints about things. But I think also we're both people who are uh, kind of picky. Um, let's just say we have standards, right? Yes. We have standards that we want things to meet. And it's yes. interesting that they're both, uh, I think, pretty high, higher than most people's. But they're both pretty different, too. Like, I don't completely even understand what your standards are necessarily, yeah, well, right? Same and here. so. That's yeah. kind of part of what's interesting to me about having this kind of discussion. Same here, like, yeah. We could talk well, about the show, but I also get to see how you see it. And I think the other part of that is that we knew that was true earlier on, too, because of, like, at the very least, stuff like Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum was <laughs> a thing that, like, I was just like, I don't, 
Like, I understand that you think that this is good in a particular way that I yeah. don't actually see. And it's like, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of those sorts of specific things that I remember uh, being like, okay, so obviously this person comes at this a very different way, but I don't necessarily yeah. know what the way is. So, you know, I can't predict it, right? Yeah. I, I I know what happens, but I, I don't actually know. Like, I can't say, oh, this is a band John will like, and this is a band he won't like. I have yeah. no idea, right? Yep. So, um, I mean, I know you probably aren't going to be like, this Taylor Swift album is awesome, but like, I, yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> other than that, I don't, I don't know much. Nope. Um, so anyway, uh, we did not plan this stream at all. What we did was I randomly happened to watch The Terror, uh, which basically I I've been looking for some shows to watch. Uh, Anna and I actually will watch shows sometimes, like try to watch series or something, and just stuff that's supposed to be good. Uh, and the weird thing is like, it's hard to find anything good. There's like hundreds of thousands of shows and it's hard to find anything good. So I'll just, sometimes I'll try to read to see if anyone has put together a list of like well-written shows or any, just anything to start with to call it somewhat. And I know I'm going to be disappointed because like Rotten Tomatoes is totally wrong almost all the time now. And I don't know, I, I don't know where to go, but I was looking at a list and it had a bunch of them and I was going through some of them and the terror was one of them, watched it. And season one is separate from season two. So I only watched like season one. Season two is a completely different show. It's like they, it's just every season, a completely different show. I watched season one and I sent to, uh, on like group chat with John and Jeff, I sent like, I thought this show was pretty good. I would recommend it. And John happened to watch mm -hmm. it. That's the <clears throat> only reason we're now doing this stream. Yeah, well, That's you know, we, we'd been intending to do something like this sort of halfway, and then this yes. came up, and it was like, sure. Yeah. And this, yes. okay, so I think there's 10 episodes, right? And yes. they're like and so just, less than an hour each. All I wanted to get out of this, like, I didn't even take notes, because I didn't know we were doing this. So we're just, we're going in cold, you get what you get. I actually have some notes of okay. things that I would that I would talk about, but they're not like extensive, serious notes, cool. right? Yeah, if we do this again, I actually I'll be more knew, I actually knew that we were going to do this you did, when yes, I was watching yes. most of the episodes, and yes, you didn't. Right. You didn't know. Um, so that's what happened. So I should start with the disclaimer that may invalidate much of what I'm going to say about this show, right? Fair enough. Have we have we talked about wine before? We have never about talked this. about wine. Okay. Also, I don't drink wine. I don't drink wine either. A lot of people drink wine, right? A lot of people yes. think it's fancy. You go, yes. you go look at their online dating profile and they're like, I love to go wine tasting or whatever, okay. right? Okay. Um, because it's this cultural thing where people feel like they're sophisticated if they enjoy wine, right? Okay, yes. Wine tastes nasty to me. It does, and I, I think it's. I think I have a certain taste bud thing that makes almost all wine taste kind of bitter, right? I agree. Kind yes. of like, so some people don't like cilantro, right? Like some people yes. think cilantro tastes like soap. I really yep. like cilantro. Cilantro tastes really Same good. Same here. Me. I think there's something like that with wine, and I think it affects Could be. a substantial portion of the population, all right? Yep like 5, 10, 15%, something like that. Yes. But you don't hear about it. Why? Because all of these people are going around pretending that they like wine, even though it tastes <laughs> nasty to them, and or don't realize that they're pretending, but they're just like, everybody else says this is good. It tastes bitter to me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's nice because that's what everybody says, right? And yeah. so this relates to Shakespeare as well. We were talking about Shakespeare a little bit. We were. Um, Shakespearean language is very hard to understand, even if you're reading it slowly, right? Yep. Um, much, much harder to understand even when it's happening live, you know, in front of you. Although, you know, sometimes the visuals help you disambiguate or the tone of voice helps you. But if the, the actors part, actually really knows Shakespeare very well, that can be very helpful because they will emote clues to you. But if they don't know, which oftentimes they don't really, then it's yeah. just even worse because they might emote something totally not contextually appropriate. Yeah, right? well, that, so. that was the thing is so, you know, I, I don't necessarily hold the Shakespeare plays in as high of esteem as many people do um, relative to other works of art, right? Some people yeah, say, I, like, I don't like oh, them at Shakespeare all. is the I'll, greatest yeah. thing ever. I, yeah. I like them. I like some of them. You know, yeah. some of them irritate me. Um, okay. But I also, you know, I kind of have to keep my opinion restrained there because I don't, I don't totally understand them that well, right? Maybe if I understood gotcha. them a lot better, I would like them more, appreciate them more, right? Gotcha. But what is for sure, again, is 
most of the people watching Shakespeare plays don't understand them any better than I do. But they, <laughs> again, they pretend that they do, right? And so sure. one time I went to see Shakespeare in upstate New York with someone who lived in New York who was inviting me. And she's like, oh, I go every year and it's great. And I went and watched the play. I forget even which one it was. It was one of the comedies where these guys at some point disguise themselves as like visiting bankers so that they can woo the women that they're after. Okay. Like whatever, whichever play that hey, is. Right. About 20 years ago, I could have told you exactly what play that yeah. is, but it's all been paged out. Yeah. I took I a Shakespeare take... class in yeah. college where we do like most of them. Um, yeah. But anyway, so I was like, I had a really time, a hard time understanding what people were saying. Right. Mm -hmm. I kind of vaguely understood the plot points of the play, but a lot of things didn't quite make sense because, mm -hmm. uh, because whatever. So I, I can't really appreciate this play that well because I didn't get why why certain things made sense, seemingly mm -hmm. were supposed to make sense. I didn't mm -hmm. understand what was happening some of the times. I didn't understand what people were playing some or what they were saying sometimes. And so I asked my friend who goes to Shakespeare all the time and says, it's great. Like, what about this specific thing or what happened at this yeah. point? She didn't know any better than I did. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> so well, let me say, let me say a few things about that, because that I I I literally when I graduated from high school, my English teacher gave me the Yale Shakespeare as a graduation gift. It was okay. like this thick. It was this the big round one annotated. It's it was like it was so large that I don't know what you're supposed to do with this book. Yeah, it's I had clearly that in just college. for graduate. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And uh, this was because I mean, I guess he thought. I liked it. I'm not sure. Like it also I, had very thin pages, right? It's yes. like giant with very thin pages. Yeah. And I guess I want to say over the course of my lifetime, I've probably seen in the thousands of plays, if you count musicals. That's like, a lot more than me. Many, many, many. Like sometimes I go to multiple in a week, right? In the old yeah. days anyway. So I am confident in saying that while I am not a Shakespeare scholar by any stretch of the imagination, I'm pretty certain I can definitively say that it wasn't because I didn't understand it. I think I understood it just fine. It's just not very good for uh, the, the axes I tend to care about. I, okay. tend to, I tend to like things that are constructed somewhat deliberately and interestingly. So it's one of the reasons I like your games it's because it's pretty obvious when I'm playing them that someone spent a lot of time thinking about why any particular thing happened or not, which is not the same as saying I know why. Like, I may not actually know what the person was thinking when they made it, but I can get this sense that, like, this was crafted with some seriousness, right? And I tend to like, like, the Amish furniture, right? I like it when I, when I feel like I got something that someone spent a lot of time crafting. Shakespeare's language stuff seems like it probably was that way, meaning there's so much effort put into the verse in Shakespeare that I can appreciate that there was probably a lot of craftsmanship going on there. Unfortunately, it's so old and so out of date compared to the way I speak and sound that it's lost on my ear. I understand usually, I, I, I'm able to parse it pretty easily but I don't see the beauty in it, right? Like yeah. there's something about its its degree of removal from my time period that it may have sounded awesome to the people who were listening to it then. Like if you were in the rows and listening to this or something, maybe it sounded amazing. And if I teleported back there, I think it was just awesome, right? But yeah. today to my ear, it just sounds kind of forced and hackneyed, right? Just, it's just not that good. Have you seen the YouTube, the, the YouTube videos about the guys who like reverse engineered what the pronunciation actually was? No. In that time based on... I would love so to hear it. There's lots of things that are supposed to rhyme in Shakespeare that very obviously don't rhyme it, in, in like today's... modern. And then there's other things okay. that are sort of puns where like one word is supposed to remind you of another one, but uh, it doesn't anymore. And so, so they, they kind of worked and, out. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of it's kind of more cool. like a Boston accent than like what we think of as an English <laughs> accent now. Um, so and they go and they they read some of it. like pack the car kind of stuff, or <laughs> I mean, not quite, but sort of. You can hey, look this up boy, later. Come on, um, we here. Yeah, that would but, be an amazing Shakespeare. It, it would be interesting to go see Boston. those guys do the plays. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you still would probably wouldn't get a lot of the things, yeah. right? But but anyway, what you said about not appreciating it because it's too far removed is pretty much what I was trying to say as well. Yeah. Which brings me to my point, 
which is this show, though being modern, yeah. was very hard for me to understand very often. Like I was sitting okay. there watching it. I had yeah. no idea what the hell people yeah. were saying half the time. Yes. Yes. And um, sometimes I like that. So one of my, what I remember as being one of my favorite TV shows was Deadwood, right? I haven't watched it in a long time. Well, I don't know what I would think of it today. Pause for one second, just for people uh, out there. So this show, I believe, at least tries nominally to get accents correct. And since everyone here was British or Irish or some other uh, uh, lineage of seafarer from the British Navy, there's heavy accents in this show. They are not speaking in a clean, like, Americanized no. dialect that's easy to understand. It's heavily accented in a number of places and different accents. Yeah, and so Sorry, some characters continue. I understand a lot better than... Are we, are we full free fire on spoilers here i assume so because otherwise we're not we are to gonna spoiler show. there's gonna be so many right. spoilers in this thing that you're gonna get you're gonna be like a spoiled milk like a rotten milk with mold in it by the time we're done spoiling kind of like sir john but anyway yes. um yeah so if you don't want to be spoiled just leave and come watch the recording later uh anyway i just wanted to bring up some examples like so sometimes you know people have like last words that are supposed to be dramatic and yep. like it's a short phrase and <laughs> I don't have me? enough time to figure out what they're saying to because sometimes the yep. length of what someone's saying helps yeah. you understand. Right. Yeah. And even some of the longer ones. So like episode nine or ten, there's a guy talking about how he went to Catholic church when he was a kid. Yep. And it goes on for like five minutes. Right. Yeah. And I know. I know maybe maybe about, not yeah. too long, but like, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, I can't. I've been listening to this guy for three minutes. I kind of vaguely understand what he's saying. Yeah, but like he talks about like communion. I don't actually yeah, yeah. understand what he's saying, right? But yes. somehow my brain gets it, but I still don't get it, right? Like, yes. and so I feel like I probably didn't like this show as much as you, and some of it may have been that, like that may be preventing, like I'm even though you're also saying it's hard to understand, it actually may be harder for me to understand because one other weird thing that I've al I've always noticed when I go to like a loud place like a nightclub, I spent a lot of time in nightclubs uh, uh. in my twenties. Yeah. I had a harder time talking to people than yeah. other people. And I don't think it's because my hearing was worse. I think it's just my brain doesn't the filtering like parse is not language quite as, as good well. or something. Yeah. yeah. Is this yeah, something yeah. weird like that? And so that might have been in play here as well. Totally fair. So you might have still understood it better than me. Um, well, to be fair, too, like I can think of plenty of reasons not to like this show. So it's not like I'm shocked either way uh, if someone liked it or didn't like it. Um, so we can kind of get to that in a second, but I would actually agree. I didn't have a hard time understanding most of it, but there were definitely a few times when someone would say something where I was like, probably should have had subtitles on for that because I was like, I do not know exactly what that person just said. Uh, and that's par for the course with heavily accented British stuff. I think if you're not really good with British accents, when yeah. you get to some of the more esoteric ones that are not like the clean upper crust kind that are pretty easy to understand, you end up with like, okay, wow, yeah, that's far enough away from Americanized English that it's hard. You know, I imagine that uh, people probably have trouble watching American shows that have heavily accented stuff. I could see certain Southern accents and certain um, like New York accents or things like this that would just be really hard for people to understand, right? Like, yeah, uh, but we just. You know, we've heard him enough. Yeah, I, I just put a spoiler warning in my stream title, by the way, just, just okay. in case. Um, yeah. yeah, so, and, and it's weird. Like, I've been to England a bunch of times. I've been to London a ton of times. And it's like, so I've been to Brighton a couple of times and, you know, Guildford and places like that. Yeah. Never was really it? had you... any problems understanding okay. people. All right. you know? Well, another and problem, so... though, too, right, is like modern, like, dialogue balance is always screwed up. So, like... It's also, it, it's usually insult to injury because not only is it accented, but like yeah. usually the balance is not great on most things I watch these days, especially yeah. movies. I didn't think this show was that bad, but it probably wasn't nearly as good as it could have been because not that bad is still not fantastic. Yeah, it right? felt actually kind of like a Christopher Nolan movie to me that okay. way. Like that dude mixes dialogue in a way that it's hard for <laughs> yeah. me to understand sometimes when it's I don't it. think you're alone in that one. I, yeah. I feel like Tenet recently people were talking about how no one can understand what anyone's saying. Uh, I haven't seen it. I, I but people it are literally saying like no one knows what's being said in the film, apparently. Like, so. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so let me give, before we get into the show then, now that you've got, you've got some background, let me explain what this show is for people who haven't seen it. 
The Terror is an anthology show. Each season is separate. So you don't watch, the seasons don't relate to each other, is my understanding. There's only two seasons of it currently. Season one is essentially a heavily dramatized, meaning there's no plausible way, period, that this is actually what happened uh, in I don't history. Know, man. It's pretty realistic. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well, um, yeah, all right. Uh, historical fiction. Uh, about the Franklin Expedition, which is, of course, a famous expedition. I'd actually read about it before, uh, where they were trying to find the Northwest Passage, as the British Empire was often, and everyone else, too, I suppose, was trying to do. Uh, and they failed, of course, to find the Northwest Passage, and everybody died. It's remarkable in the sense that I don't know if there were any other expeditions that were quite so catastrophic. Like, this was two full ships, full complement staffed for like three years worth of provisions and everything was lost. Not a single soul survived. Um, and the ships were both lost. We've only recently recovered them in the past 20 years. They've found the wreckages of these ships, but that's how lost they were. So uh, this is a fictionalized, heavily fictionalized, like retelling. It's based on a book um, by Dan Pattinson, I think, called The Terror. And uh, I don't know how closely it used to the book because I haven't read it. But season one is that. Season two is set in a Japanese internment camp. Has nothing to do with this. We haven't watched that yet, so we're not talking about that. We're just talking about season one. Ten episodes, about 45 minutes apiece. It's on AMC. So I believe that meant it had commercial breaks. And neither of us mm -hmm. watched it with those breaks. We watched it on streaming. Yeah. So that's what we watched. And uh, so, John... I said I liked this show. So yes. why, and you didn't necessarily like the show or at least didn't like <clears> it that much. So why don't you start off, describe, I mean, you, why don't you just lead off? You don't have to lead okay, off with well, any particular, but so why don't you lead off? I, I will say there are certainly inflection points. So there was a time when I was uh, complaining to you about it via instant message, which is also the time when we decided to do this, right? Yes. That was sort of the nadir of how much I liked the show. Right after that, it got okay. a little bit better to me. Okay. And then it sort of plateaued. I wouldn't ever say that I super like it. Um, okay. I do think it's better than prob probably the majority of, you know, modern streaming TV right. shows. You know, like if you pick, yeah, if you pick the bar a random Netflix show or whatever, yeah. it's worse than this, right? Yeah. That's so what I thought. So we agree too. there. Um, yes. Is it good enough that... I would be hyped to watch season two. Maybe not. I would be interested. I would be interested in the way that like, oh, I hope season two is a little better. You know, fair enough. I, um, so the way the, the reason why I was bummed it, like three episodes in or whatever. Right. Um, there are actually some specific things that I can get into. But but the general thing was just, you know, I'm watching this show. It's obviously about I didn't know the historical connection. I didn't know this right. was a real thing. But right, like, right. okay. It's obviously about people getting killed one by one in like yes. long form. That was oh, very yeah. clear from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you kind of this will maybe make more sense later in the discussion, but I'll say I'll say briefly like that kind of thing makes more sense, or or is better, works better when the people are kind of trying their best you know what i mean ah, like yeah. people are kind of trying their best but because people are imperfect or because they're you know because their judgment is off a little bit or whatever um things spiral and, and unexpected things happen and whatever right yes right. and so that wasn't really what i was seeing in the first couple episodes it was more like everybody's an asshole everybody yes. makes bad stupid decisions yeah everybody hates everybody else yeah and humanity is terrible and let's just flush it all down the toilet right now which i don't i don't really yeah. appreciate because a like we just have too much of that in fiction but b it's not really real it, it, that's not how it would actually be i don't think right at least not in the so we could talk about the end of the show later like toward the end of the show that kind of thing is fine, I think, right? But I but see. in the in the beginning, you would have a lot of people constructively trying to solve problems and failing. Now, the the place right after I complained to you was the episode when 
I, okay, so because I don't understand what people are saying, I have a <laughs> poor grasp of the names. Is it is it yes. Burchard, like the the sub oh. the captain of the terror, the junior well, captain guy? So what I should say right up front, and this yeah. will always always haunt me, if we choose to do this as an actual series where you and I talk about shows. I remember almost everything that happens to every character in every show, but not their name. Okay. I never know. Like, even in shows that I watched eight seasons of, I don't know the names of people like on Mad Men. You're okay. like, I'm just like the guy <laughs> who did blah. So I, I don't know. Like, you can, I, I don't know what that is. My brain will never remember names. So are you talking about Jared Harris, basically? I, I don't know the actor, but okay. the guy, okay. There's not really main characters in this too much there's a couple people right. who are sort of main one of them yeah. is the guy who's you know the captain who they start talking about right where they're pointing at his photo that's the guy i'm talking that's about, the right? okay yes that's jared harris the actors for some reason okay. i remember the I, actors I, I don't know him right and then sort of yeah. the other main character is this guy named mr hickey who we'll probably talk right. about so he yep. becomes one of the main characters more and yeah. more as the show goes on right yeah and then maybe the the doctor doctor uh good sir yes right, yes is sort of one of the main characters yes um, but there's just a lot of characters. And so yes. like a lot of, a lot of minor characters get a lot of screen time. Anyway, yeah. one reason why this also may be part of my personal problem is I was sort of tapped out on this. So I just read like the first culture series novel. And in that, um, I don't know what that is. Sorry. It's like this, you know, far future science fiction. There's like nine mm -hmm. books in this series or whatever. Oh, and I never read any of them. You hear them referred to a lot as some of the like most far out science fiction Far and, out? Well, as in terms of imagining a distant future that is impressive or something. Like, I don't know how to put it. Okay. Um, I don't find it as impressive as some of the stuff by Greg Egan or whatever, but um, in terms of the thought right. behind it. Right, right. Um, but uh, okay. like the first book, just like everybody's an asshole and everybody hates everybody and everybody okay. makes poor decisions. And nobody really has much in the way of redeeming value. Uh, I see. And I just fucking hated it, right? And I was like, if this is what this series is, I'm not. And then I started reading the second book. And the second book is a guy who plays a lot of games and is very serious about playing games. And he's just a miserable asshole who has no redeeming <laughs> value. And so okay, is everybody okay. else. And however, I did sort of start reading some notes about it. And apparently this turns around later in the book. But I was just like, I, I was see. an hour into the audio book. And I was like, oh, my God, not again. Okay. Right. Well, um, I can I can possibly add one thing to that, which is to say that I don't think that you and I are probably that far apart on that opinion with one important caveat, which is I actually have literally no problem watching shows where everyone is an asshole. In fact, I quite enjoy it if I am not meant to root for them. Like my, I have a huge, like for example, an, an asshole is probably the wrong word, but let's say asshole and or idiot. Yeah. So for example, I cannot watch Marvel movies. And the reason is because everyone in that movie is like stupid. Even characters yes. that are supposed to be very smart, yes. like Tony Stark or something, is yes. an absolute idiot. Like they're so dumb that they can barely handle like a child's level of strategy when involved in any kind of a fight, right? And so I just can't handle it. I'm just like, yeah. why am I watching a bunch of really, really, really severely IQ deficient superheroes run around doing stupid stuff? This is ridiculous but right? that's you know in some sense that's modern writing right yes it's not, it's not so so to clarify for yes. the audience i've talked to casey yes. about this enough that i know exactly okay. what he's saying okay. it's not that the characters are supposed to be stupid right, right. it's no. that the writers a, just have no attention span and don't even well, think it's because the writers are stupid yeah. they don't know that the characters I mean, are doing stupid things <laughs> if, if you if you go on youtube and search for the phrase pitch meeting and watch the pitch meetings yeah. like yeah. that is exactly the problem with all these movies all right. And as far as I know, that is the process as well. Like, like yeah, that's, I, that's I don't a document. Know that, yeah. Pitch meeting is a documentary. Pitch meeting, hidden camera. Screen rant pitch meeting is a documentary on what is actually going on in a writer's room, as far as I know. Because, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, we can talk a little about that later. Because recently I watched two things that absolutely they were on Disney plus they had making ofs that I watched and they were some of the most depressing things I've ever seen because they confirmed all of my worst fears and more about how they do writing these days or mm. don't do writing these days might be the way to put it. But anyway, um, so what I was going to say is one of the reasons that I didn't have that problem in particular with this show is because 
maybe again I had the unfair advantage going into it is I knew about the Franklin expedition and my understanding of that expedition had always been that everyone on it was stupid. So I felt like I was seeing a fairly plausible kind of group of characters because they were literally really bad at Arctic exploration. And apparently, at least as far as we know from what we've recovered, just made really bad decisions and did things that people shouldn't do. So I was actually okay hmm. with that because I'm like, yeah, they probably did have people in charge who just really shouldn't have been there. And like they said in the actual show, these people were no one's first choice. They were like yeah. way down the, the the totem pole of people who should have been leading an expedition and it showed, right? So yeah. I didn't have the same problem with that only because of that, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. Anyway, the, the, the inflection point that changed my mind, because it was just going downhill, right? And then when when Captain Steubing, uh, whatever his name was, right? Um, <laughs> like decides to kick his alcohol addiction, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, wait. So not only is that a character trying to do a positive thing and trying to solve a problem, yeah, but it's also like the writer is not doing the laziest thing to spiral down. Because the, yep. the obvious lazy thing was he just yep. gets more and more drunk yes. and makes worse and worse you know, yes. orders and whatever. And they didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. Right? Yeah. Um, so th then I started getting more interested in the show and it started seeming better. And there were characters that seemed to be trying to do, you know, like, like, you know, Dr. Good, sir. He's not really a doctor, but like want to be Dr. Good, sir. Yeah. This is a funny show. Cause there's three doctors in decreasing orders of training. Yeah. Yeah. There's like actual doctor. Yeah. There's like kind of doctor. And then there's yeah. not at all a doctor, but yeah. would like to learn to help yeah. people. So, But is the only one who actually has any initiative uh, in terms of actually figuring stuff out. Like he's the one who does the experiment on the lead poisoning with the monkey. Like no, that's, mid that's middle doctor, right? That's Dr. Goodsir. Or, or is there another yeah. doctor? Yeah, Dr. Goodsir is not a doctor. Right. But then there's the third guy. There's the guy who in like episode four or whatever is like, oh, oh just I says, would like, like to help out. I'll fill in. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's who's that's like doctor number three. Yes, yes. You can't really do anything. Yes, no. Yeah. Okay. Um let me okay, I gotta uh turn off my air conditioning and grab a drink. So All right. can you fill in for like one minute while I do this? I can. Sure. Um so yeah, so just to give folks who haven't seen the show a little bit more background than on it while John is is uh turning off the AC. So Essentially, this show follows the Franklin Expedition, which is two, you know, uh, tall ships, right? They were exploration ships. Uh, they look a lot like what you would imagine, like a, I don't know, like a 1700 ship to look like, right? Like a big thing with some, some big mass, but they're actually not. It's 1830s, and they have actual coal engines in them. So this was kind of like the time period where they had they still used like sail power to like sail around presumably for efficiency i guess i don't know much about seafaring but because of the fact that they were trying to do like arctic expedition stuff they also had like a coal engine and a propeller on the back of these ships so it's like a hybrid vessel uh both sailing and uh prop there are two ships. One of them is called the Terror. One of them is called the Erebus. The Erebus is actually the flagship. So it's the one who's leading. And the Terror is like sort of the ship that's the second in command. And in fact, there's two captains. Uh, so because each ship has a captain. And uh, the captain of the Erebus is actually um, not in the show for very long. Uh, spoiler warning. He actually bites it pretty early, which leads the uh, captain of the Terror to be the captain for most of the rest of the expedition uh, because he has to basically be uh, promoted. And that leaves the second in command uh, for the Erebus as like the co-captain. I don't know what the correct naval terms are for these things because nobody it's not a rank because one of them's like an admiral or a lieutenant or I don't even know what they are. They, <laughs> those, they have different pretty different. They have like totally random ranks, right? Because like the yeah. the guy who's the the next captain, he's a lieutenant, right? Because he's nothing. He was not an admiral, and he was not a. I don't even know. Yeah, I have no idea. But point being, in naval you know parlance, obviously you have like your rank in the navy, 
and then you have your rank on the ship, and those two things are not the same, and I can't explain them because I don't know what they are. But yeah. in terms of who's in charge, it ends up with the, the person who's, um, who was uh, the original captain of the Terror is now effectively in charge of the entire expedition. And now John is back, so we can continue. Yeah, um, I will say I played Return of the Obra Dinn a year or two ago when it came there you out, go. and that helped me understand the show a little bit because when they said like yeah. Orlop deck, Orlop and stuff, deck, I knew that's what that the only was. reason I knew what that was too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Lucas Pope. Yeah. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, you said you were fine with totally stupid decision making. That was one of the things that bothered me consistently. Mm -hmm. So I have a bunch of notes about bad sure. decision making. Yes. Some of which I think is supposed to be bad, like it was written to be bad decision making, right? Yes. And some of it is Avengers Infinity War writing. Okay. Right? And I feel like both of those were, none of it was anywhere near as bad as like a Marvel movie, right? But I, right, I right, still right. felt like there was a bunch of that. So that yeah. the decision okay. making that was written to be bad that I thought was too stupid and I would have liked it to be smarter because yeah. it would have been more interesting is like, okay. so in episode one, they're making this decision to sail onward, right? And like Sir Sir John, who's the admiral or whatever, yes, wants to go. And uh, Captain uh, B, B, I don't remember his name. I said Captain Steubing as a joke, and that's yes. all that comes to mind now. So all right, yeah. Captain Steubing is like, no, Jared we got to turn back. Okay. Yeah, Jared from Subway yeah. says, yeah. Um, we got to go back, right? Yes. And Sir John's entire reasoning is, mm -hmm. look, I want to find the Northwest Passage. Yes. We're basically like two weeks from finding it. Yeah. So it'll be fine. Yeah. He literally just says that like three times, right? Yes. Whereas I would, so something that would seem more realistic to me would be something like, hey man, I, you know, you weren't in the meetings where we came up with the guidelines about where to go, when to go and when to turn back. And I was there yeah. and they have a certain amount of safety margin built in. And like, you know, because because we've, you know, I've got experience here or whatever, right. it's fine. Yeah. And like that kind of rationalization about why it would be okay to go on would yeah. have made sense and would have sold it better, I think, right? Whereas okay. like, we're gonna find the Northwest Passage in two weeks. Like they don't know if there's a Northwest Passage, right? Literally, they do not know. Well, okay, so the reason I would disagree with that characterization is because I agree that that is a bad decision. And I mean, yeah. we know that that was a bad decision. And furthermore, we know that was a bad decision that they actually made. So the yeah. question is just, well, is it sufficiently motivated in the show? And uh, while I'm certainly fine with an argument that it's not sufficiently motivated, because who's to say what's sufficient? Yeah. I thought they at least spent a lot of time telling you why that happened. Because even though at that point in the show, you didn't have any information about why this guy is such a hard-headed idiot. In many future scenes, they give you his backstory in the court yeah. where they explain why he's just dead set on getting there that year, right? I so, don't remember that. Maybe that was some dialogue I didn't okay. understand. So they have, basically, they have a bunch of scenes between him and his wife where he's hmm. talking about the fact that he isn't able to basically progress in society for reasons which they don't spell out like in detail because that part of the show isn't like elaborate. It's just like flashbacks that you sort of see these like conversations for. Yeah. And basically they come to sort of the, uh, not agreement, but where they leave it is that like, this is what's going to be what lets him get back into like an upwardly mobile path in society. Mm -hmm. And so like his reputation with his wife and his reputation in the Navy are all riding on him finding this passage. So while it doesn't really explain why he didn't do a better job of selling it, the amount of time they spent justifying it, plus the fact that he's supposed to be stupid. I mean, that was what I got from it anyway. Like he, he is the guy who made the stupid decision, the biggest stupid decision yeah, yeah. in reality, mm -hmm. right? He can't be a very bright guy because a bright guy wouldn't have done this. I was fine with it. I was like, yeah, okay. Like he kind of just seemed like one of those like people who, you know, you work for if you work at like Intel or something and you're just like, yeah. yep, this is an idiot VP, but, you but know, any, of, okay. any, you know? 
I, that's like, all. I, I get that. It's just, and, and I don't, I don't mean to say that that one thing stuck out, stuck out mm-hmm. especially yeah, yeah. much. It's just, I'm, I'm kind of picking it as an example of a pattern. Um, that's fair. I will say that what I did like, I like some of the, the time cuts that they do in the show, right? Like, uh-huh. as far as I remember, the end of episode one is like, they're arguing about this, right? And then uh, episode, probably, yeah. episode two starts and it's like three months later and yes. it's like frozen in the ice yeah. completely. And you're yeah. like, oh, okay, well, yeah. and that was interesting. And they do that in a little bit in the middle in the end. And I like that. But um, yeah. So there's kind of a spectrum, I guess, between like decision making that like is characters being dumb and decision making that's like writers not doing the thing that would obviously happen and it yeah it so part of it is a symptom of of the way i think modern storytelling happens especially for tv shows um yeah and I, I don't know exactly how they wrote this but what i think it was well don't forget it's also yeah. a book and there's an important caveat to include here which is all the people have to end up in the right place which is tough there's graves the grave the people whose graves they are have to be in the right place at the end of it the boats have to be in the right place the yeah. lifeboats have to be in the right place so there's a lot of constraints on this where you also had to meet and so I'll, I'll yeah. put like well, well that makes sense too anyway um yeah. so that probably makes it harder but the thing that I was going to say yeah. is the way even even storytelling that doesn't have to comply with those constraints right right, right. Mm-hmm. the way it often works especially in Hollywood movies but also in mm-hmm. TV shows and stuff is they decide on like what the main points are of what they want to happen right like first we want the characters to be here and then we want this to happen and this to ha- and that, that and and you have this set of things imagine it as like points on a 2D graph right and then your actual scenes in your shows are like how you interpolate between those points, right? And I think there's an inherent problem with that entire method of writing, which is it doesn't allow... Um, it, or I won't, even, I won't say allow, but it doesn't encourage... It doesn't encourage diversions from the interpolation, you know? Like, right. It's well. It's it's designed backwards, not designed forwards, yeah, as the, we've the, talked about before. Yeah. It, it doesn't. It doesn't encourage a certain kind of imagination to happen. Yes. Right. Whereas if you were instead like, I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Next. Yeah. What would happen if these guys were in the scene? You would. You would get ideas that just don't come the other way. Right. And and so that's what I felt like this show was early on. And now, now that you say that it had these constraints to me, which I didn't know. Um, that kind of makes sense. But this is also something yeah. that I've just seen in other in other writing as well. Yeah, right? there's not a lot of excuse for this in like a Disney film or whatever. In this particular case, I do think there are some excuses. Now, to be fair, I don't know if they're actually legitimate excuses. I don't know if they got the locations of these things right, right? Like I didn't go check. So, uh, but you know, because it's historical fiction, they do have a lot of constraints they have to meet. Um, if they actually chose to be good about it. And again, it's also based on a book. So to what extent certain things are the fault of the book author versus the fault of the television show author or whether, you know, you know, the book could have been better and the TV show screwed it up. There's a whole bunch of things like that, too, that I I couldn't speak to because since I haven't read the book, I don't have an opinion. I'm also not an expert on the Franklin expedition. So, you know, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just throwing out some some possible things here. Yeah. So I, I have a few other examples from my notes that I took about things that I think are fall into this category of bad decisions from people who that sort of happened mid to late in the show mm-hmm. from people who were supposed to sort of be the competent people. Actually, two of them are sort of the Captain Steubing, right? OK. Um, yeah. So at the very end, right, we'll be a little yeah. non chronological here. Yeah. At the very end, it's supposed to be this dramatic thing about how he's like, oh, tell them, tell them that I died. Right. He, he yeah, tells yeah, yeah. the Eskimo guy. Right, right, right. right. Uh, yeah. Tell them that I died. Right. Yeah. Like if this guy is supposed to be, resp- he, he's been portrayed as being very responsible after he kicked his alcohol. Right. Even before that, he was responsible. And then he got maybe driven to drink again by the disaster and then recovered. But he was always yeah. the guy trying to make good decisions and watching out for people and no man left behind and all that stuff. Well, yeah. And, and to say made good decisions, maybe made noble decisions. There are possibly times when he could have made better decisions yes. that would have made that would have had harsher sacrifices, for example. So, yes. okay, so good Casey, is relative. But when this next expedition shows up and the Eskimo asks, 
hey, Captain Steubing, what should I tell them? Yes. What do you think he should tell them, given his character? What do I think he should tell them? To be honest, I have not thought about the that. The number one most important piece of information. Where the Northwest Passage is? The fucking cans are poisonous. Don't eat oh, from those. <laughs> the lead cans. Your entire, your entire expedition will go crazy if you, like, he just doesn't give a shit for some reason. Much um, like I point. would have forgotten about that. Much like he did. I, like, I don't think you would forget. <laughs> in, in a year or two years two or years. however it long was two it years was. At the end. What? Two years later, it pops up on the screen. Yeah, two years um, later. He, let's pick another one. Uh, one-legged coast guy, right? So, so the guy who like straps all the forks to himself yeah. to go fight. There's a monster in this, by the way. Yeah. To like, I guess the plan, it wasn't clear until you see it at the end, but I guess the plan was you tie a bunch of forks to yourself and then get eaten by the monster and the forks will poke the monster on the inside. Yeah, I mean, so, so here's one thing I'll say is by the time they get to that point in the show, everyone is supposed to be somewhat delusional. We will talk about that in a minute. Okay, I understand this. Let me get to that. So I don't actually know one of the problems that I... So there's a couple yeah. of things that... So since I have complaints with the show as well. Yeah. Um, but I'd probably talk more about the things I liked about the show first before I talk about things I don't like about the show. But either way, I Okay, let's, let's do that. For, uh, okay. I, I have a whole lot to say about the okay. delusion part. So I okay. want to leave that. And I, I do right, think okay. it's good because that's very negative. So I do think it's good to talk about what we liked about the show. Okay. okay. Let me, let me finish this list. Cause I've just got a list of four things sure. and, then, and then let's go to that. Um, so this guy, you know, he's out looking for the monster, right? And he yeah. like spots the ocean and he writes like Northwest passage on his map, yes. even though it doesn't yeah, yeah, connect yeah. through. Right. He's at yeah. least, I like, didn't know what that meant. I had no idea what that well, was supposed to mean. He saw the ocean. He, he had no supplies with him. He wasn't dragging a boat, right? He's right. within a walk with no supplies of the entire rest of the team. Yeah. There's probably fish in that ocean and shit and like seals and stuff. I guess. He, I don't know. His yeah. number one duty as soon as that happens is to go back and fucking tell people. Well, so was there. I, there's a couple and of things. He doesn't I, care. Like, so, okay. Let me, let me ask decision, a question more right? broadly there. Yes. I wouldn't even necessarily say that that part was bad decision or good decision. I would more say I didn't understand the ending. The series of events that happens at the end was not particularly scrutable to me in general. The reason for that was because at one point in the show, very near the end, yeah. there is a scene where one of the people um, cites a seagull. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yes. It's very specific. Never spoken like, of again. Actually, you know, there's two because one time one guy from one of the teams spots it visually. Yeah. He's like, yeah. am I hallucinating or is there a seagull there? Yes. Other people see that. And then in the Hickey team, okay. they mention it verbally. Okay. And I, I think the guy was in Captain Steubing's team, right? Who saw yeah. The, the original guy cited it was in Captain Steubing's. So team. they both saw birds. Right. And so what I don't understand is nobody discussed or took action about that at all not follow not, that fucking bird see where not, it goes it was stupid like like you yeah. were saying like stupid decisions this was just a case of the show raising a point and then acting like they'd never raised it and i didn't understand why like am i supposed to believe that the characters are too addled at this point were that were they actually trying to follow the bird and couldn't yeah. what is that not what was going on so somewhere around that point the show kind of like devolved for me in a way that i was like it wasn't enough for me to say I don't like the show because I liked mostly everything that happened up to that point. Yeah. Well, but like the very end was kind of hard for me to swallow because I'm just like, it's it's not even just that I disagree with some of the things that happened. It's more like I just didn't understand. It, it, it fell apart in terms of connective tissue a little bit. And I was like, didn't really, I don't know. I do and think I feel like maybe what happened was like, they've got the book and they're yeah. like going you know, they're putting the book into a show 
And if you'd read the book, you'd know what happened after they sighted the seagull and nothing comes of it or something. But, but, like, but, don't put it in uh, the show, right? It, but, but now in the show, I'm like, okay, but I didn't read the book, so I don't know what happened, right? And so yeah. there is a little bit of that anyway. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I kind of like the way it became more disconnected at the end, but that's, that's something okay. we can talk about later too. But the, okay. yeah. I want to come back to the, oh, he, because okay. I put in my notes, why didn't he run back and tell people about the coast? Oh, wait, and what was the seagull? Going, yeah. He's going crazy. Yeah. It's fine. Maybe. Right? And we'll I that. guess. I so then, then the last weird bad decision, it's similar to the seagull thing, I guess. Um, these guys are, they're, it's, they're still early. They're still at the boats, right? It's that part of the show. But they know they're having problems. They're going to have a supply problem. They're going to have a shelter problem, maybe, because one of the boats is like sinking and stuff. They know there's Eskimos around. Even, right. even before they accidentally shoot the ones, right? Right. There's like the, the woman is there first, I think, right? No. No, no, no. It's her her and okay. It's her and her friend or whoever. Her, her father. Or, okay, father. Right? Whoever it was. I thought it was her and her father, and she got sh- sh- he, he gets shot. He gets shot. Right. I, I was thinking later of the Mr. Hickey Eskimos, right? Oh, but, that well they just yeah. That's yeah, totally but funny. but so initially though they know there's Eskimos around. Yes. You're trying to survive. Why isn't your number one plan? Let's figure out where the freaking Eskimos are and how they're surviving and what they're eating, and try to do that. Like that is like not even a thing in the show at all. You know what I mean? And they try to talk well, that off. They they have an Eskimo scene where they try to talk that off, where the guys like I'm not sure I know what- too many of them. Just like there were too many bears last year and whatever, whatever, right? Wait, wait, wait. But why would that... They, at that point, don't think there's anything wrong with their food. So why would they care what the... Eskimos well, they're talking about when the supplies are going to run out. They're already... Very early in the show, they're like, we have enough supplies to get to, like, summer. And if the ice doesn't thaw this summer, we'll be stuck here and have a problem. Like, they're, they're saying that stuff, like, by episode three or something. You know. But it's not really because of food. They have three years of food. So the problem is they're stuck there. They don't want to be there, right? They no, need no, to figure no, out no, a way no. to get somewhere else. They had three years of food from the outset of the voyage. Yes. Right, which it is very late in the voyage by this point or something, I think. It's only like um, one year in. They have two more years of food. There's an episode where they talk. They're still on the boats, and they're talking about cutting people to three-quarter rations to make the food last. Yeah, I thought that was because they couldn't use, like, the canned food or something. I don't know. That part is a little hard for me to understand necessarily because I wasn't taking notes, like I said, so I don't remember exactly. But at the point where they first encounter the Eskimos, they don't have any... They couldn't go a whole nother year without even being worried yet at that point. A lot of time passes in this show. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. When they initially... so. The first year of their journey, they get trapped in the ice, and that's when they accidentally shoot the Eskimo father mm-hmm. and uh, encounter the Eskimo daughter as a result and try yeah. to save the father but fail, right? Yeah. That uh, incident happens when they still have like two years of food left. It's only much later, much, much later, that they think they might run out of food at all. Like, like after John's already torn in half and thrown down a hole and all that stuff is. Was they, that much later? I felt like much. all these things happen. Okay, so, no, so no, maybe no. I missed the, some time cuts. No, no, I'm saying it's after that. That stuff happens in rapid succession. Most yes. of those events happen, and then much later is the discussion about having to go down on rations. Right. Much yeah. later, like maybe after I'm, the guy kicks his alcohol habit and all those things happen, then way down the line they're like, okay, yeah. So, so at that point, why are they not like we need to do some Eskimo diplomacy? Like that's the number one. That is thing. that is what they do. That's what he says. He says, we'll get all our stuff. We're going to go south to where the Eskimos we think are and make contact with them. But then Mr. Hickey kills them. So they can't. That is exactly what he said the plan is going to okay. be. Okay. I just didn't he's like, we're going to go at that point. Okay. Though. He's like, we're going to go south because I know that's, that's in the direction of where the Eskimos should be. At some point we will hit them and we will make friends and we will live off of seals. Like okay. that's what we're gonna do, and then yeah, Mr. I Hickey totally killed. didn't understand that. That is what happened. Totally so they weren't. That was not that. a bad decision. That is, they were doing what you wanted. Okay, let's talk about what we liked about the show. Okay, you, you want me to start? start? I don't I've know if you like the show. Yeah, go ahead and start. I liked several things about this show. 
Thing number one I liked about this show is there wasn't a lot of crappy acting. I know that's a weird thing to say about a show in 2020, but oftentimes the acting sucks in a lot of shows. So thing number two that I liked about the show and I liked a lot is that it felt like at least in the first few episodes, people were thinking pretty hard about most shots. Most shots looked good. They were lit well. They were framed well. And it wasn't just like we randomly shot some people doing some stuff and didn't care like a Marvel movie. It was like, oh, if we put the camera here, we can frame this guy in a doorway down the deck. And he's supposed to be feeling that kind of claustrophobia at this point. So it makes sense that the shot looks this way. I felt like the people who were actually doing the production on the cinematography side cared about what this um, show looked like a lot of the time. Now, the CGI for the monster was horrible. That was some Jurassic Park shit. There. It was really yeah. bad. Yeah. So one thing that is a, a little bit unfortunate is I can't give the show a an, an clean mark for looks gorgeous because any time that you were supposed to see this creature, yeah. um, it really looked freaking terrible with the possible exception of the very last shot where it's dead that looked okay mm. even but that was every weird. Yeah. it was it was okay though i was like that shot was okay i i wasn't like oh my god every other shot it looked absolutely terrible um and so oh well but at least on the like traditional photography side and on the side of like any cg they were doing to like put the boat in or the ice in i didn't notice a lot of problems there so the the non the non-special special effects, the stuff to just construct the environment felt good too. So most of the time when I was watching this show, I was really enjoying what it looked like. And that's also pretty rare for shows. There's a couple of them. Better Call Saul comes to mind, for example, where I watch the show and I'm like, someone thought about every shot in the show. I don't see that very often, but this show was one where I was like, okay, this had like good production. So I really like those parts of the show, which leads into the third thing I liked about the show, because those two things are both really important for thing number three, which was most of what I liked about this show actually had nothing to do with the plot, because honestly, I could care less about the plot. Most of what I liked about this show is I felt like it did a good job making me feel like I was stuck on a boat in the Arctic, freaking out. Like, I just felt like the degree to which it, like, constantly kind of felt a little bit claustrophobic and, like, grim was just, it worked for me. I, I just, in much the same way that maybe you didn't like it because you were like, I think you used the phrase impoverished worldview <laughs> to, to yeah. describe it. Yeah, I'll um, say in, more about in, that later, but yeah. In much the same way that you didn't like it, I think that part of at least some of that came off actually as a plus to me. I felt a little bit of the like suspension of disbelief during the watching of the show where it just kind of felt like it was on this ship seeing some slices of these people's lives and it sucked, which is exactly what I would have imagined it would have been like if I was on that expedition. Cause I would be freaking out way worse than they were freaking out if I was in such a certain scenario. So most of what I liked about the show was those three things put together. Um, very competent acting. I thought, plus a good directorial cinematographer feel to most of it, with the exception of the monster part, added up to a good feel. I just, I liked being in the world they were creating and it was different enough from my world that I enjoyed that sort of like projection to another place. In much the same way that I never have this feeling about say fricking like Star Trek or something where it never feels like I'm actually out there in space or whatever. They never managed to cross that gap of making me feel like a day in the life of a starship, I feel like this show crossed that boundary and that's not nothing because it takes a lot of craftsmanship to pull that off at all, um, at least for me. So I really like that aspect of the show. Um, what I didn't like about the show, uh, I'll say briefly and then we'll kick back to you and you can do the same, then we can expand, I suppose. Yeah. What I didn't like about the show <clears throat> was twofold. Thing number one was I would have preferred, especially because the CGI for the monster sucked, at the early in the show, they did sort of more Jawsian portrayal of yeah. the monster, which is 
you don't really know if there's really a supernatural monster or not in the show for maybe the first three or four episodes, honestly. It could just be like a polar bear or something out there that's like occasionally like snatching a dude when they're like not looking or something, right? And that part of the show worked really well, I thought. At a certain part, maybe around episode five, like maybe the halfway point, I don't know, maybe a little earlier, it becomes very clear that it is not a polar bear or any kind of even plausibly super animal animal like Jaws was. I mean, obviously Jaws is a lot more capable than your average great white shark, but it's like clearly this like demon God thing that like hangs out with the Eskimo people and sometimes terrorizes them and, or sometimes helps them depending on whether their shaman is able to control it or something. Right. So it's kind of a little bit mystical. That part I thought, honestly, just straight up sucked. The reason I thought it sucked was because it goes against what I thought the show did well, which was making me feel like I was actually out there in the ice with the Franklin expedition. And when you start to tell me that, no, there's this weird Eskimo demon God hanging around doing stuff that really like ruins that whole thing. And I would have been totally fine with like skating that edge of going the entire series, never knowing if it was a polar bear or some weird supernatural demon God, that would have been fine. But crossing the line into no, it's definitely a supernatural demon God weird thing was not. That was my biggest complaint about the show. I have other minor complaints about the show, but that was my biggest. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of the things that you liked about it. I did notice the cinematography being good, you know, quite often. Um, I do think, I mean, there's also sort of a problem with it. Like I noticed the cinematography repeating itself sometimes, but it's like, it's, there's a lot of hours in the show. It's not like a two hour yeah. movie. So you kind of got And the it. budget is limited. <clears throat> yeah. And so. so it was more like, let's find the, the camera placement concepts that are going to work for this show and we'll yes. just sort of use them when they're appropriate. Yes. Um, but they were good, you know, like I, yeah. you know, the boats, especially in the interiors of the ships were shot yes. really well. Um, and the sets felt good too. Like they didn't feel like a lot of the sets <clears throat> I see nowadays where it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have the kind of level of detail that makes me feel like it's really there. Um, Star Wars movies comes to mind a lot in this where the sets just look empty and stupid yeah. nowadays. Um, I feel like the, like it looked like, okay, there's stuff everywhere and it feels like someone was probably living there to a certain degree. Right. And I like that. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I thought the acting was good to the extent that I could understand the, <laughs> the things. Although in between two ferns, as he asked Benedict Cumberbatch, do you think if you didn't have an English accent, people would know you were a bad actor or whatever. Um, that yep, might yep. be happening, right? It could be. It could um, be. I, I copped um, to that as well. I but I also, I mean, I liked the character design and, you know, yep. the costumes and everything. Yeah. Um, even down to little things. Like, of course, you know, when they're still relatively civilized and they're on the boat, and they're wearing the more or less standard uniforms that people wear. There's just like touches to the costuming about like, oh, this guy's collar is this way or whatever the hell right like that yep that stuff was good um there were moments of the writing that i liked like the the example that i gave already uh, about you know not doing the obvious thing of the captain just becoming increasingly drunk or whatever right right, right. um or just were... having him become sober in five seconds which is another thing they do like he actually to go through a period of sobering up that was yeah. like long and laborious. Although, there's which... an interesting tension here. Like there's a thing I really liked about the writing and a thing, there's a downside to the thing that I like about the writing, right? So the thing okay. that I like is I like the time jumps that they do pretty often, right? Not sure about the ones at the end. We can talk about that later, but like the, the rest of them I, I mostly like. And... um. That's cool. The downside is it removes space for development and stuff, right? So there's there's character arcs that I pretty much like. Right. So so for example, like like James McJames or whatever that he was great. name was. That I guy really he was my, pretty much my favorite actor in the show. Yes. Um that guy was really good. Uh, and his character arc was good. Yeah, and I it thought. was good and it it mostly comprised 
like there were sort of two dimensions to his character arc, right? There's his relationship to Captain Steubing. Yes. And like hating him at first and then becoming friends yeah. with him, right? Yeah. And then there was like also in parallel with that, like his his need to puff himself up and be yeah. and look pompous and or, or whatever, yeah. like yeah. present himself to yeah. other people as yeah. being above them or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was good, although like like I think I think the writing sold that to me, but I might have liked to see more of that because I like that agree. part. And then the time jumps, the time jumps like skipped over a lot of it. But they did a good job, given that those time jumps were there. The fact that they sold that character arc and it didn't feel bad or fake was good. That might be a great credit to the actor, maybe more so than the writing. I think I think um, I would give it to the actor as well. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the backstory of that character is delivered in almost like straight expositional dialogue at the end. Oh yeah. In a scene that's actually quite good, but that should have come out more earlier in some other ways that help bring that together. And I I would give the actor who I've actually seen before, I just don't know his name. Um, he did a fantastic job selling that because that was literally expositional dialogue at the end and he yeah. sold it as like a, a pretty serious character breakdown and he did a fantastic job. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, some, sometimes the acting compensates, right? For the, for the writing, yeah. not giving stuff as that space and, and that's why it's so important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry to derail you. I didn't mean to. No, uh, I mean I. Was, I think those were those were the things that I like. Like I agree with you a lot about the things that were good yeah. about the show. Um, the thing that I didn't like that overrides all of that, right? Okay, is, is sort of the the thing because I, I have a lot of I have a lot of complaints that I can go through here in the notes. Okay. They're all specific instances, but the reason they matter is they just sort of fit into this bigger pattern, I think, right? And right, yeah. It's what it's they like, add up to that's presumably more important. And and here we, we have to get to the question of, like, what, why do you want to see a show in the first place, right? And the reason for yes. you is probably a little bit different from the reason for me, right? Yeah. Um, but there's, like, there's something that I get. Like, what do I get out of watching something that I that I appreciated watching and I'm glad that I watched. Right. Okay. Usually yes. it's like, I, I think of it as I'm like taking something with me in the rest of my life that I wouldn't have had. Right. So, yeah. so the common pop culture idea of movies and film and whatever is that they're like escapism. Somebody spread this idea. Like when I was a kid that these things are escapism and people watch them because they let you forget about your stupid life and be okay. somewhere else. And that's, that's an, one reason. That's, that's an a ingredient. reason. Yes. yes. But if that's all they were, I don't think they would be nearly as popular as they are. Like these shows. Well, it's, it's obviously not true because you have many people many times saying things like I became a rocket scientist because I love Star Trek or something. I mean, yeah. people say that stuff yes. or I went into the, the, you know, composition because I watched Star Wars like that happens. So obviously, even if you want to take only the most superficial examples, these are clearly affecting people in a way that at least they believe has affected their life, whether it's at a deep level or not is hard to say, but it's, it's clear that self-reporting argues it is. Yes. And so, so when I go to see a show, right. Or a movie, I'm looking for something or for things. I'm okay. not trying to get away from other things. Right. So, I see. but it's hard to pin down. What are these things that I'm looking for? I see. Um, cause they could take different forms. Right. Um, but the, in general, in art, broadly speaking, there's a thing that happens when somebody just, you know, does something amazing. Right. And Like in some sense, that's what high art is. It's like you're trying to do that amazing thing, right? And you know, okay. it's like like very high art, like like Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel or something is like I'm gonna do okay. this huge amazing painting, right? So you mean literally high? Like it has to be high up? Yes, on like the a, there has to be a, a ladder with a lot of rungs. <laughs> no, um, 
there's this thing where, and, and like, why do artists do that? I guess, because it's not, it's not the, like, there's a bad version of that where you're like just trying to do something that'll get a lot of people's attention or that's big or something. But there's like, when you're really making art that comes from a place of you as the artist see something in the world that you regard as deeply interesting or very beautiful or mm. like deeply engaging in some way. And then you're trying to illustrate that or embody that or explore that through the thing. Right. Right. And uh, yes, I, I understand mm, what you're saying. That, that's the thing that I appreciate most. And, you know, sometimes people don't quite know they're doing that. Like, or, right, right. you know, but, but, you know, so for example, when, when, James McJames gives this really good performance, right? Yeah. He's drawing on something as an actor that a lot of actors don't have. You and sure? even though I don't know what that is, or I wouldn't be able to do it myself, I appreciate, I feel like there's something there, right? Right. That's yes. deeper than what a lot of other actors are doing, especially in that, or including in that show, but especially yes. in a Marvel movie or whatever. Right. Yes. And so there's a version of that for, for cinematography, right? There's a version right. of that for score, for, for all sure. these things. Yes. And I felt like, and, and so for me, that's the line, right? If a show goes above that line in some ways, even if a lot of it is bad and sucks, I'll still appreciate the show. And so an example of that is Twin Peaks season three, a lot okay, of I which I- Twin Peaks, sorry. Okay. A lot of it I cannot stand. A lot of it okay. is is just- annoys me right okay some of it is just straight up bad okay but, but some of it is really deep and interesting and amazing and you can feel that like he was he was making the show for those amazing parts and the rest of it were just like he was doing whatever he could do to like get the rest of it together you know okay um, and so so i i appreciate it even though i see all the flaws in it right and okay th this show uh, I feel like it's somewhere else on the spectrum where it doesn't have very much of that amazing thing that I want to see about the universe reflected in the art. It, it has a little bit of that, <clears throat> mostly probably brought by a couple of the actors. Okay. Especially that one actor. Um, but on the technical level, it is relatively well crafted for the most part, except for, except for, uh, you know, the monster CG. Well, the monster, yeah. The monster yeah. Was, um, was, yeah. And so it's kind of like the girl with the nice body who you don't want to marry because, <laughs> okay, like, what would you say to her, right? Okay. You know what I mean? Not exactly because there's dimensions uh, to that analogy that also are not appropriate. Like I'm not, I'm not physically <laughs> attracted to this series in any way either, but it's like, what are you saying, John? <laughs> You're saying you know, that this movie was not erotic enough is basically what you're saying. No, well, it was very unerotic. This is okay. one of the most unerotic. It, it was the least shows. erotic show. Um, there but was... That was oh, this actually ties in. So there's a lot of like body horror in this, in this show, yes. right? There's a lot yeah. of like people hmm. are slowly decaying or like brutal things yeah. happen to people. And they have like close ups of grisly things. Yeah, and yes. so first of all, I don't like that stuff. Uh, broadly okay. speaking, I'm very squeamish about that kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah. But I also just don't <clears throat> like it. Um, okay. And there's but there's ways to do it that again I feel like. So like if you watch a David Cronenberg movie, which I really unfortunately kind of have. Thing. Yeah. Um. But he does it in a way where like he's somehow fascinated with that stuff in a way that he brings something to it. Whereas okay. in this in this it's like we're gonna show. We're going to show a deep in shot of this guy's, you know, big gaping wound, and that's going to gross people out. You know what I mean? It's kind well, of like, you, is you know how Game very, of Thrones... It's just literal. It's just very literal. Like, I guess what I would say is, in this show, like, in the book, it's like, and the guy's head was torn open. Then when they shot it, they literally just said, okay, there's the guy with the torn open head. That's yeah. it. There's no, it's just literal. You it's know just in, literal. in Game yeah. of Thrones, how, no, at least I in don't. the early seasons, did you not ever see it? I've never seen it. I stopped watching it once they switched to TV writers, okay. but um, okay. 
Wait, what? Was it different writers? Well, Didn't they were following the books for the early okay. for the early seasons. Oh, okay. And okay. then they ran out of books, and they were like, "Oh, the TV <laughs> writers will write the plot from I now see. on." And okay. It was a disaster. I couldn't couldn't okay. watch it anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> I did, yeah. Uh, but there was this thing in Game of Thrones where like they had to have boobs every episode. You know, okay. or whatever, because right. like HBO was right. telling them. I felt like right. there was like there has to be some gore every episode or whatever. Okay. Well, there just were no women the in this show, you know. Um, well, there was it, there was literally three women in this show. No. Well, yeah, five. there was there was five technically if you count the two Eskimos who got killed at the end, but they don't have any speaking parts. Those those two, because most of that party gets killed. There's only one Eskimo in that party of five that even gets to talk, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's not really but, the end. I think of that as the middle or whatever. But anyway, um, it's like episode eight. Is it? I don't yes. know, dude. I just no, watched them all. It's, all right. Wait, it's episode eight that Hickey shoots the Eskimo party. He doesn't shoot that's them. not true. Or no, stabs them or whatever. Oh, wait, no, he does shoot them. He shoots some of them, probably. I don't know. You don't see it. So I guess I don't know what he did. Oh, no, but. no. Actually, it's not Hickey. Like what? It is Hickey. No, no. Okay. So one of the dudes, the dude with the blondish hair, isn't he like saying Hickey said this and that and we had to shoot them or something, you know, one of them. Like there's a point where he's explaining to Captain Steubing like right, what happened, right, right. but it all is off screen. You know, but you don't know if he's telling the truth or not. You have yeah. no idea because that guy's in cahoots with Hickey, so he could be lying. I had no idea what I didn't know what happened to the Eskimos other than they were killed by Hickey's command or by Hickey. I just don't know. Yeah. And then you see their bodies, so you know they actually were so, killed. So, but... so let's talk about Hickey for a bit, right? Okay. Um, he was one of the main characters, as I said. I was. really didn't like him both ways. There's a way that you're not supposed okay. to like him, right? Because he's yep. a bad guy. But also, either there's something about the acting or the writing or something that I didn't like, in in the sense that like, I thought the acting was poor, personally. So, like it was it was not bad enough for me to not like it, but it was like on the low end for the show. Because yeah. I feel like I feel like the actor had one trick, yeah. which was there's this one smile that he does, yeah, which is something yeah. like like I'm smarter than everyone and. I'm embarrassed to be around people who are this dumb yeah. or whatever. And he uses yeah. that like all the time. Yeah. And, and so I guess this guy is supposed to be, and this is maybe a problem that I have with the writing too. He's like supposed to be really smart and, or, I mean, he's obviously, he's supposed to be like a sociopath of some kind. Definitely he's, supposed a sociopath. To be, he's supposed to be good at manipulating people, but I, yeah. I feel like he's also supposed to be smart or something. Maybe. He doesn't really ever do anything smart except Not really. He, he does he does know one thing, which is that if you get people to eat something bad, they're now guilty and are complicit. He does that in like with like if you eat the captain's dog, right. you're now guilty and can't really be on his side or whatever. Right, 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 right. And, you know, the same thing with people later on uh, yes. in the show. Um, yeah. But. But other than that, like I wasn't. I wasn't sold on the character. He was just like the character who got to keep doing stuff for no reason, for no talent of his own. You know, I would agree with that. And I didn't necessarily, so I didn't have a problem with any of that plot in the sense, in the same way that I have problems with Disney movies where the whole movie sucks and it's horrible. Yeah. It was not, I did not have those feelings about it, which maybe you sort of did a little bit. The feelings I had about the part where like literally eight, nine, 10 is what I think, where I think of it as being in the series. Yeah. It turns into a little bit of a like Hickey versus Captain Steubing thing. And I just don't care about that. I didn't think it was interesting was my problem. And it was less about whether I was finding it believable or not. And more about, I, much like you were pointing out, James McJames yeah. being yeah. the sort of high watermark of the series is sort of like character emotion depth. Yeah. That scene. 
I just wanted more of that. Like, I just wanted to see how these various people, including Mr. Hickey, who doesn't need to become some kind of a criminal mastermind for this show to finish with everyone dead, as far as I'm concerned, because they'll probably yeah. just die anyway. Yeah. Um, I just kind of wanted to see them face down their eventual demise in a relatively emotionally satisfying way. And the fact that they chose to introduce a sort of higher stakes spy versus spy plot element to the last three episodes to me just felt like taking up a lot of screen time with stuff. I just don't care about. Well, and also like, I just fundamentally did not care. There was this weird thing that didn't make that much sense about it. Right. So at first I thought the plan was right. Hickey grabs a team full of people and steals yeah. the stuff. And yeah. he says early on, like an episode or two before they actually do yeah. it, he's like, we'll grab, the, yeah. grab the map that shows the way to whatever yeah. and then burn everything burn else. The right? yeah. Now, okay, the weird thing is that team is not the people who... So th this this is a little off the topic, but like the they burn down the carnival, but it's not one of the dudes on that team who does it, right? I, oh, I thought okay. it was like... It was like burning down oh, the carnival happens way earlier than this. No, because I thought they were burning down the carnival and then the monster shows up at the end of that, right? No, and you're thinking of when they're going to hang them and they're in a big dust cloud. Oh no, you're that's right. when the monster shows up. It's you're totally correct. it's okay. way later. I, I was mix, it's mixing those up. A month later or something, yeah. Right. So they don't get to burn anything in that case because like no. they're just like, right. we're getting the hell out of here, yeah. right? Yeah. That's why nobody ever actually burns the maps. I don't even know what they ended yeah. up getting for maps. That was not clear. Um, okay, but but the point being, I, I was led to believe, at least by the show, or maybe by me not being able to understand Canadian, um, uh, that they thought the captain's plan was not that good, so they were going to go somewhere else, or maybe just in a smaller party, right? But yeah, I, I figured party like... The, point. the whole point was they thought they could go faster as a smaller party, and then they end up. They didn't basically go didn't. any faster, right? Yes. Yeah, First didn't. of all, and, and so there was no like real discussion. So that was weird. It's like, it was and, weird. and you can see why this happened because they need for the purposes of the writing, the two parties not to be separated right. because if they do separate yeah. completely, then no it becomes tension. a really weird show, right? Yeah. And so they had to not let that happen, but that was really weird and artificial. But, um, but if I may step in here for a second, yeah. I disagree, not with any of your analysis, which I 100% agree with, but rather with, with your quick conclusion at the end there that they needed them to, to not separate. I disagree. I would have much preferred the show where they separate and never interact with each other again. That would have given me exactly what I wanted, which is the ability to see how these two sets of people face down their eventual demise that's i don't need them to have this conflict and i think the fact that the writers thought they had to make a traditional climactic ending to this show was exactly yeah. what ruined the ending for me because what i liked about the show through the first seven episodes at least was that that wasn't happening there wasn't you know a lot of traditional cliffhangery stuff and i thought sometimes I, I you know i don't have a problem with that i like that kind of show too but this type of show was let's just show the life on this ship and how it's working and i love that it was very much to me it was not as good as mad men but it was a yeah. similar type of show it's like mad men is just some people at an office living their life and we don't feel the need for every series uh, episode to have a certain amount of conflict and a certain amount of resolution. It's just sometimes shit happens and that's fine. Yeah. That I, I, was working really well on this show. And when it turned into at the, at sort of that, that point that you're talking about, when it turned right. into, we have to engineer this stuff to be a conflict. That's I think what really fell apart. For yeah. me. I, I agree that that wasn't a good decision. It would have been a, a braver writing decision to have oh, them stay goodness. separated. Yeah. I do think they're maybe hamstrung by some other things. So if I were going to do that, if I were going to try to write that, you know, one way to do it might be, hey, let's try to contrast the groups, right? Exactly. Like, how do they handle various situations? And some of those are that. just, well, sort of, right? Because James McJames says you should, I'm dying anyway. Just feed me to the, feed me to the other people. Just eat me. And you'll it's you'll stay alive, 
And and Captain Stubing is like, no, we're not going to yeah. do that. Whereas the other guy's like, we should eat this dude. Right? So they, yeah. they literally did exactly the thing I wanted them to do, but they only did it once. And then the rest of it was this big machinations yeah. plot with a goddamn Eskimo demon monster. <laughs> yeah. So, I yeah. It, it would have been much that. better to make a pattern out of that, right? Yeah. And then, and then, how do you? So, so one way that you do it is by you know having the clock tick down, kind of like it was. But yeah. they were a little bit hamstrung by the setting. Like if you imagine this was like Game of Thrones or some fantasy world or whatever, yeah. and both parties are trekking to Mordor, right? right. You would have right. like they're in the cliffs, and then they have to sneak through the wolf den, yeah. and then whatever. And you see how they handle. You would right. like the setting would naturally give you something to work with as a right. writer to do sure. that. When the terrain is a vast plain of nothing, as it sort of had to be for the show, um, that doesn't give you anything to work with, right? But you and don't so, really need it because it's about the interactions between the characters. So you just have to create... I mean, you've seen this happen through the entire show. It, it's about two ships that get stuck in the ice. Literally nothing happens on this show. I mean... Let's be honest, yeah. if you took out the demon monster, there isn't really a lot happening. It's about interpersonal conflict and decision making. All you had to do was just have them be making decisions like, do we eat people? Do we try to look for seals? Do we try to do this? How do we interact with the natives? Whatever it is, right? Like, yeah. that's not that hard at the end of the day because they've been doing it the entire series and then they gave up mostly i think intentionally like they wanted to make this weird like con conflict oriented ending and i just don't think it was the right decision for yeah this, I, I, for this I agree with that like the, the yeah. split up can can go very bad like battlestar galactica season one had like Hilo okay, on I, caprica for the whole season i don't think I, I i think i only saw the first four episodes of that show so yeah I, it, it was they, real bad um, but but like you said, the structure of how do these groups deal with these similar problems yeah. would have tied it together and been good. Yes. And yeah, I think that's where I would have gone. Instead, with it what, what they did kind of sucked. But anyway, so I yeah. thought the plan at first was do this thing. But then later, the plan is I'm going to offer up my team to the monster and then try to take it over. Right. It was that's very like strange. Very and, strange. And so at some point that appears to have become the plan or was all along because they did like even early on when they're tracking away, they're like trying to sight and track the monster. Right. But it's weird because if they're going, if they're trying to go toward the monster, why are they going the same direction as the it's other team for weird. like weeks? Right. It's very weird. I didn't like that. And I also thought that my assumption is that there's a fair bit of like, it's the book or not the book. Um, happening there where it's like okay obviously what happened is somehow hickey knew some of the stuff that the girl eskimo silna i think her name was yeah um it's actually someone whose name i remembered uh hickey and silna so hickey knew some of the stuff that silna knew like he hickey specifically cut off his tongue to feed to the monster which yeah. is what Ilna did, well, but I have no idea how he knew that. Exactly right. So he somehow figured it out off screen. So he, right? everybody, everybody knew that the original Eskimo guy didn't have a tongue. The guy who was shot, he might have even been there when somebody said that. Yeah, so right? just like Ricky um, kind of like put that together, but how did he know that's what he should do? Or well, uh, that's the thing, it, right? I don't know. Like, so it's I, kind of he's supposed to be smart by observing. You know, he makes these hammy faces like he's observing things, right? and noticing things. Sorry, I just had to close my windows there. Keep going. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they try to direct him to, like, be like he's noticing stuff around the camp or whatever. So it's plausible that off screen he put these things together, which, again, leads toward, like, oh, this character is supposed to be smart. But how dumb do you have to be to think that if you don't know all the Eskimo lore, controlling a magic beast... Yeah is going to work like it you wouldn't. Right. Yeah. And of course the answer is no, he's crazy. Right. Which yes, okay, let me get won. to that. Cause this is the thing that I like the least about this show. Um, people in the audience may not know, uh, both myself and Casey have written fiction before, uh, written fiction, right. Um, not, not TV shows or anything, but, um, I, I wrote some short stories, totally write a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I wrote some short stories back when I was college in college uh, that actually appeared in paper and ink magazines back when that was a thing. Um, and uh, Casey wrote a book at one point. Well, two, how, how actually. Long, how long ago was that now? I don't know. Okay. Ten years? Is it? Oh, my God, dude. Anyway, so we both wrote stuff. So we both thought about writing probably more than it might come across, right? Like, I used to think about writing all the time. I don't as much anymore. Um, so when I was young and in college and trying to write stories that were like profound or, or felt cool or whatever, right? I didn't, I was like 18, right? So I don't really know that much about what's profound or is actually good to write and whatever. And th there were tendencies that I found myself trying to do, right? that I notice in other people's early writing as well. And they're kind of just weak cop-outs, right? Okay. So among the weak cop-outs are protagonist kills himself at the end, right? Okay. To, because that's a dramatic ending punctuation, right? right. Um, for example, Darren Aronofsky's film Pi does this. Right, And right. it's right. stupid, right? right. It's like right. just not a good ending. He doesn't and kill himself. He just drills a hole in his head. Okay, but basically, He's still alive. <laughs> I, I I don't know about that. Um, what do you mean you don't know about that? He's literally sitting on a park bench at the end of that film, talking to someone. They clearly I, showed that he was fine. I have a different interpretation of that scene, but anyway. Okay, we, this is not. We can go rewatch Pi. Yeah, we're gonna later. have to now. Um, we're God, the thing to. about the thing about the two hundred and sixteen digit number drives me nuts in that movie. Oh, I hate okay. that movie. I thought it's that like, movie. Was absolutely terrible but that yeah, but it's a math movie written by someone who doesn't know math but that's a very good way to say it. let's get back to the i actually like aronofsky mostly i just that movie bothered me um so where the hell was i before i was complaining about that um well you were talking about the well i guess i don't know exactly what you're going to lead up to but perhaps the oh writing we crazy. in writing okay one I of them is that. your character kills himself at the end um, if you grew up on Marvel comics, probably the Marvel version of this is the world's going to end and or does, right? Um, right, right, right. You know, I once wrote a... Sh well, we'll skip that. Um, but uh, so another thing that young writers, I think, do a lot is like our character is just... He's going insane and that's so dramatic, right? And okay. like all sorts of crazy things can happen because he's insane, right? And if you decide that people are going insane it's sort of a get out of jail free card for anything, right? Like, why did Mr. Hickey think that this would work, that he would hold the right, tongue right. up and the yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Cause he's going insane, right? Yeah. Why did Mr. Forks not go back and tell them about the water? Cause, cause he's going insane, right? Why did, why did Mr. What's his name? Arsenic, Mr. Good Sir, arsenic himself, and then have people eat him even though that didn't really affect the plot because the guys didn't really get sick enough for uh, the matter. No, that seemed good. Because he's going insane. Like, all right, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that part, but okay. I mean, I sure, yeah. Like, I sort of get why he would. Let me put it this way: if it didn't fall into the bigger pattern of all these things not really being like that one, right, right, yeah. could work. But it just is just like, uh, this like. It's well, my, my main complaint with that was just that the show knew how to do it well and chose not to, is the way I would say it. You can portray characters going mad by having them be more aware of it. Like James McJames's character. Yeah. Like voices yes. his yes. concerns and his troubles as he progressively declines from the lead poisoning, and it works great. That is what should have been happening to everybody um, and also there was another character who literally just goes mental and he's just running around screaming. That's great too, because that's like, it's not excusing anything. It's just like, no, there's some people going legit, legit legitimately crazy here. And it feels proper when you do that. The rest of the characters, either they were trying to use the, they're going slightly crazy as a cop out or the things that they did were actually not supposed to be crazy. They were just supposed to be things that the characters actually thought they should do, in which case it just isn't very good because it just didn't make a lot of sense. Like you said. Yeah. 
So, so basically, I'm trying to say, though, I think the crazy thing is basically a weak crutch completely. Like the version of this show that would have been better writing wise is. Hey, a lot of the cans of food are spoiled. Yeah. It's not mystery lead poisoning crossed with botulism crossed with evil that makes you go crazy and makes your body turn black or whatever. It's just they're spoiled so we can't eat it, right? And well, they it, can't really do that it, because we know they actually got lead poisoning, so. Okay, whatever. But, like, lead, sure. po lead poisoning doesn't make bullet wounds that have been healed for 15 years, like, suddenly open up and whatever. Like, that's not what that is, you know? I don't know anything about lead poisoning, um, I can't help you there. Anyway, like the version of the show that would have been better writing wise is like the yes, people like the the mini society of the the shipwrecked guys decays until everybody's like fiercely fighting each other and stuff. But it happens for regular human reasons, like disagreements and uh and they do that sometimes, right? Like I think we should leave the men behind who are sick. Yeah. No, we're not going to do that. Yeah. But, but yes, but no. Right. Yeah. And then the guy later and he's like, we're going to, we're going to go fucking attack the other camp. And they're like, but there's been a vote and we didn't. Right. That kind of thing should have been the driver behind all major events. Not this guy went crazy and did this thing. Right? Correct. Or the other thing that could be a yeah. big driver of events is just like accidents. Like early on when it's very Obra Din like, I liked some yeah. of the things that were happening. Like yeah. the guy climbs up on the mast to get away from the monster and they're trying to shoot the monster yeah. with the cannon. And I'm like, oh shit, they're going to shoot the guy. And they actually yeah. didn't. But like yeah. that kind of thing, like when there's pressure on and stuff is happening, like, like yeah. when the first Eskimo gets shot, right? Like that kind of thing is believable. And yeah. Or doesn't they, they had a nice rely on everybody's going, going crazy. The 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 guy in the diving suit going down and knocking the ice away, and then it turns out the propeller's bent, so now we have to change. Like like small things like that that just add up over time to like having to make major changes feels really good. Did you yes. see Sunshine? No. Sunshine. No. I can't say I recommend it because mm, there's a lot of things that are not good about the movie it's a danny boyle movie um but the one interesting thing that i will say about this movie is that like the entire movie is about the fact that someone does a slightly off calculation on where to set a particular sun deflector shield on a spaceship in the future and the whole movie is basically downwind of that and i was like that sounds like you say like a much more plausible thing to happen in science fiction is that like you just make one small mistake and because there's so many things dependent on that in things something like space travel you just you've got a shit ton of stuff to deal with downwind all of a sudden that you didn't have to before right so yeah um yeah, and I, I, I'm not, I don't think it's exactly plausible that I'm saying, but just like better. Like it's more meaningful if it's about it's humans. It's interesting. It's more yeah, interesting. But it's, it's more like, like this applies to me in some way. If it's about somebody making a mistake or yeah. having too much of a grudge with somebody yeah, in a yeah. way that getting going crazy from lead botulism doesn't apply to me. Right. Although that could happen. It's like not something, you know, it's, there's a way that it's just more meaningful. Um, I agree. So that, I that is my biggest issue with the show, actually. I would also contrast it back with Marvel because they're a popular punching bag already on this stream. Yes. And say like, this is also why I literally could not give a shit about Infinity Stones. It's like, I just don't fundamentally care about <laughs> arbitrary crap that has to get collected for some reason. Like yeah. it's just not very interesting because it doesn't actually have any actual understandable consequence to the people watching, right? Like 100% of the stuff that will happen has to be explained to me. Whereas like the types of things that we're talking about here, they, they're nice and tangible. I, I get, what you mean when you say that oh the propeller got bent so we have to switch to the ship or like i can 
I can grapple with that and it makes me feel like I'm actually understanding the stakes from day to day. Whereas if you're just like throwing crap at me about what generally is happening right now, because you've made it all up and none of it is logical or consistent. I'm constantly just going, okay, if that's what you, if, if you say so, right. And we're on to the next thing. So it doesn't give me as a viewer any time to really anticipate or worry or even feel relief because I don't know what's going on really. Like I only know what's going on after you've told me what happened instead of before yes. which is the time when I want to know. I want to have expectations about what might happen before it does because that's right. like a crucial part of the drama to me. And you know, in a Disney movie, you literally have no idea what could or couldn't happen because the writers had no idea and they just wrote something down that's completely impossible. It breaks all the rules they've set up before. So you never, there's never any sense of drama or tension because you're like, well, any, literally anything could happen in the next scene. So I just, I'll just wait and yeah. have them tell me, right? And so I do think that one of the really nice aspects um, about what you're talking about as far as looking at small things is it's a good way in the writing to get tangible understandable stakes that people can can form like a mental model of and invest in right because you have to be able to get into the story somehow before it can really have an effect on you emotionally or, or anything else really at least for me and i find that there's a lot of barriers to that when it's just all this arbitrary stuff yeah there's a there's a related but different thing um switching sort of to the way that i view movies right which is when you build a plot around, we have to get the MacGuffin or like the five yeah. infinity MacGuffins or whatever, yeah. right? Um, that's just, it's an easy way that you get to play Mad Libs with the plot, right? It's like you have this right, and right. this and that, and we just have to fill in the blanks. Yeah, kind yeah. of like what I was saying about interpolating between points early on, yeah. right? It's a, it's a well-known easy structure for that. And then you think your job as a writer is to just fill those in and then and then you're done right and the problem with that is that's every other movie right and so if i'm looking for special insight if i'm looking for something especially interesting or especially beautiful or especially intelligent right um it's probably not going to be a mad libs movie in part because the process of making one of those mad libs movies is not going to generate that in part because the people who have those insights are not going to want to make fucking Mad Libs movies, right? So maybe they can't make movies in the modern environment, but in part also because sometimes you break those things in the process of trying to fit them into the fricking Mad Libs, right? You like break off what's special about it, um, which I even have to worry about when making games. And it's yeah. something that, that I'm very, tend to be very worried about. Um, so, well, I, I guess I would push back on that slightly. And the only reason I say that is because Maybe that's true from the standpoint of if your goal is only to ever make movies that are transcendent in that way. Like the way that you're describing that is it, it, spiritual is probably the wrong word, but it's like kind of similar. It's like you're actually asking for something that's sort of more like a spiritual communication where you're saying, here is something deep and meaningful and I'm communicating it via film because that's like the medium that I understand how to work with or something. But that's definitely a higher bar than competently made show. Yeah. But I don't, I don't mean and, to push it quite that far. Like that's, okay. that's the dimension that I appreciate the most. Right. And that's what, that's the kind of thing that I try to do. Right. But right. there are other things that are, that I wouldn't say fall into the spiritual category that are still that I appreciate. So, for example, like, you know, a classic thing to do in movies is the impressively long single shot where a bunch of cool right, stuff okay. happens. And right. at that point, it's more like it's more like you're doing an Olympic dive or something. Right. right, right. Where it's like it's a very impressive thing to do. Gotcha. And I, I appreciate those two. Like sometimes I don't have enough education to appreciate those as fully as I should. But I do appreciate those in a certain in a certain way. Um, I do think they can be empty, but but sometimes in the act of being maximally good at a thing, you generate something beautiful in that act, right? Right. Even if that wasn't your intention. Right. You know what I mean? So like okay. like if you watch the best dancer in the world do a dance or something, right? 
um, something is embodied there, even if, even if they're just doing the thing that they know and they're just like, I'm going to go out and like do, do my things that I've been practicing 20 years or whatever. Right. Right. Anyway. Um, but so it just, I don't, I don't find that stuff usually in, in these movies. Right. And, and movies are written increasingly in this way where it's just like filling in the blanks, you know, and, well, and so I just, I see the blanks and then I see the thing. It's like, you know, when you read, when you see a Mad Libs page, it's like there's the typed out words and then there's the blanks yeah. and you like pencil in. Yeah. I can see the pencil and the typed out words and the blanks in all of yeah. these movies, right? Yeah. And I don't even make movies, so I don't know how people who watch movies can possibly or who make movies can possibly watch them or, or TV shows. Well, I guess uh, so two things about that. The first thing I'll say about that is that I think you may actually be giving, you know, at least the Disney side of things too much credit by calling it a Mad Libs movie though, <laughs> because that assumes that you actually wrote out some of the words ahead of time. And based on the limited experience I had watching their making of documentaries on Disney plus, because I was curious about exactly this question. I was like, why is the writing in, in literally all Disney movies horrible? Um, they don't even have like major plot elements they don't even know them until like many scenes have completed like production. Well, that happened with star Wars for sure. Right? Um, I don't know about other well, movies. This was like, this was, I think the one that I remember this specifically from was frozen Two. So just a random, you know, massive hit animated one that they did. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, it was weird because you literally will watch, if you go watch that documentary, which don't bother, but like if you did, you would see literally there is like a scene where there are a bunch of people, the director, writer, the co-director, and like multiple people on the production scene team are literally sitting around a table. They are maybe six months or a year away from finishing this thing. So tons of scenes have already been animated. Like, I mean, it is way in the process. They're talking about whose voice the character has been hearing for the entire film. And I'm like, you wrote, directed and animated half of this film and you don't even know basic things about the story you're claiming to tell. I'm like, yeah. I don't know if that's the height of irresponsibility or some kind of new like Jackson Pollock style, like we let the paint fall on the canvas movie making, but it was really horrific to me. That's, that's another Battlestar Galactica right there. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, but putting that aside, what I was going to say was uh, my criteria for enjoying a film or a movie despite the fact that I more or less have the same experience you do, which is like, I find it incredibly difficult to watch a lot of movies these days um, because they seem to be written so poorly yeah. uh, and made so poorly. Actually, one of the interesting things, at least about Marvel movies is the cinematography is absolute garbage from start to finish, which is a really odd thing too, because blockbusters used to be more about that. But yeah. um, one of the things that, uh, that I would say when I go to the movies is I actually just want a completely made movie. I don't actually need something special in the film. Like, like I am totally happy if you literally, like I just enjoy watching movies in general. And if you just show up and do a competent job, right. Yeah. Um, I am like really happy about that, but increasingly like in general, I just don't think that the competency level is there anymore. The writing is usually terrible so bad that like literally from scene to scene it doesn't make sense like the two you, you know like you'll just get major things where you're like that can't happen yeah and you didn't care right well, like you just you know right? there, there's common classes and i think i think we've talked about this before but okay. i'll say it for the stream there are common classes of things that movies do all the time that are like obviously just terrible writing and obviously writers just don't care right there's like yeah. Yeah. the plan that somebody has that only makes sense if they knew what somebody yeah. would do like way yeah. later. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, there's, yeah. there's plans that only make sense. Uh, that only make sense if you don't think about what happened, you know, 
if you don't think about what a character actually would do and instead th that character does the thing that's necessary for the plan to make sense you know what i mean like well th i would say that even talking about plans is getting well, ahead of us yeah our that's that's a big yeah no, well they... there's there's entire scenes that like don't make sense if you think about four minutes ago in the movie right but, but there's, dude, forget all of that. Yeah. I'm just talking about like, literally there will just be characters who they wanted two characters to like have a conversation or something. So that character just shows up and you're yeah. like, that person literally had no idea where any of this was or that it was taking place. And they just show up, right? It's yeah. like, they literally don't even care anymore. And one of the interesting things about this is just so I knew I wasn't crazy, I've been paying attention to old blockbusters yeah and i defy you to find many instances in the classic blockbusters of the era and i'm not even talking about like jaws or something i'm talking about like home alone or something like pick any blockbuster that you wouldn't even put in the pantheon of like classic filmmaking they went out of their way to have scenes that explain how various people got from one place to another or yeah. why they were there yeah. right like that actually was a thing that always happened. Yeah, nobody cares about that anymore. When nobody they cares. They're just like, nope, they're just there. Yeah. It's just, just people are wherever they need to be. We don't care if they couldn't have known or couldn't have gotten there. They're just there. All right. Let me go. Let me go. I made a few notes about uh, things in this show okay. that I felt like the writing really didn't sell. And I'll say okay. what they are. And then you can tell me if you disagree. Sounds right? good. And you can violently defend them or undefend them. The Sounds thing good. that I thought was the most absurd, and they tried to sell this in several different ways, right? And none of it worked because it was so absurd, was okay. the fire that burned down and trapped everybody in the carnival, right? Right. So they're out on the ice. Well, before, before he even let's, okay. the doctor burning it down is one thing. I actually... Okay. I I'm didn't sure know I think why he that. did that, really, to be honest with you. Because he's crazy. I guess, but he wasn't really. But he wasn't, but he was just keeping it inside. I, I think the implication, like only in retrospect, I didn't have a hint of this at the time, but I think the implication was when the dude came in and was telling the doctor how he couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. The implication is the doctor had gone along that whole path and was further but he had just such a curt demeanor and was so good at keeping things buttoned up. Okay. And the reason that he was recommending the guy to go to the carnival was not, oh, you can chill at the carnival, but like, yeah. look, I will kill you. Maybe. And everybody else, if you go to the carnival and will yeah. end your suffering, right? Yeah. But I only can ascribe that meaning in retrospect. I don't feel like there right. was very much. But no. anyway, um, so it's just so absurd that like, somehow with like a day of work, they made an impregnable fortress out of like yes. bales and yeah. stuff and all this. And the, the TV trope of like alcohol being super flammable, being used to set this whole place ablaze yeah. and nobody else noticing that enough alcohol was being poured out despite the fact that it was full of people and like the, the skins and cloths and stuff like not being wet, despite the fact that it was freaking snowing all day. Right. Like well, the other part, they wouldn't that really too burn. no steam anywhere. It's a fire on an iceberg yeah, and there was on an iceberg. <laughs> and like somehow people are stuck in this maze of stuff. Like it didn't make any sense. Right. Yeah. They tried, they tried in a few ways. They had it built up against, ice cliffs for some reason so yeah. that was like one wall and then on their way in they're all like how did they manage all this and there's like you know they're walking through a little weird maze of bales or something but like it's still there's no way like that is definitely a thing where writers sit down and they say how do we have a disaster that kills a lot of dudes right well, so now, here's, that would have made way me... more sense. There was a different time. So remember when they were on the boat and like the hatch was iced closed and they couldn't yeah. get it open? Yeah. If the boat like freaking burned down, that would be way more believable, right? Yeah. Then so, like this thing that they built out on the ice somehow burned down. That didn't make any sense. It was so two, two things about crazy. that though. One, did very many people die? Because I didn't actually think that many people died. I, I believe some did. Okay, so, so there's a guy who got stabbed, actually, which I thought was yeah. not too bad. Although yeah, that was cool. 
I, I like think that. if I were in that case, I would have started up, right? Yeah, like yeah, fell yeah. for Slack. But okay, there's that guy. At least a couple. They give a tally of like some people who burned. Either way, it was like at that least five people. Second. But he, my complaint with this is again really has nothing to do with that. My right. complaint with it is I don't care. That was again my problem. Is it didn't have anything to do with anything. It really right? didn't have anything to do with anything. It didn't set up or resolve any. My main thing with with writing that I want to see yeah. is I like for the things in the plot. To the extent that you're going to have a plot, it should be there to create scenes where interpersonal or personal things are brought to fruition. Now, yeah. sometimes if you're doing like, like maybe if it's a Ted Chang piece, it's not about the people, it's about the science fiction or something. And yeah. I would relax that constraint and say, okay, you're just, you're trying to do some like science stuff. So people are secondary, fine. Yeah. But the vast majority of the time, I want you to mostly be using the plot as a mechanism to create the interesting character dynamics that will make for scenes that are good, right? I mean, you know, some of my favorite films are, you know, might be ones that have almost no plot at all, like Pulp Fiction, where 100% of the things that happen are just to create interesting scenes. It's not, nobody cares what the actual, like, outcome of this series of events is in a, like, vanquishing good and evil big plot thing it's just like yeah. no it's it's like we're trying to create all these interesting scenes where people do interesting things that's the point burning down the carnival seemed a complete waste of time because i didn't care and I, it didn't really even affect the future in much of any way at all and so the only thing i can think of that might excuse this is again i don't know if one of the constraints is we found ruins that is a burned down carnival <laughs> and so we have to freaking explain that somehow. Right. And maybe. if that's the case, I'll give them a buy because it wasn't like completely implausible that maybe somebody kind of like decided to burn things down, but like they could have done a lot better. Yeah. Well, so like if you said, was, if it wasn't the case, like if they didn't have to hit that, if that wasn't a target, then I just don't think that should have been in there. Cause it didn't, if there's to just have the carnival and take it down, it doesn't need to burn down for any particular reason. Yes. So, so what you said about it should have been about the people yes. is right. And they, they kind of tried to set that up in two ways, right? So they tried to do the doctor thing, which again was weird and didn't really, really sell. Maybe in the book that was a thing. I don't Maybe freaking know, book. right? Yeah. Um, the other was like, this was so, like James McJames was acting captain because Captain Steubing was drunk, right? Or recovering from being drunk. Yeah. And was in rehab. Yes. Um, so you know, he was talking to his sergeant or lieutenant or whatever the hell it is in the Navy. It's not a sergeant in the Navy, but like the guy's like, look, the men, if they're going to go on this voyage, they need morale and morale is yeah. already bad. So you got to get morale up. Right. And so that was an abstract concern. Yes. And then so you would if this were a video game, the penalty for the carnival failing would be to put your morale below where it was initially. Right. <laughs> It's like risk reward, right? Like success brings the morale up, failure right. brings it down below, right? Yeah. Um, or maybe somehow a charismatic leader turns turns that into some new energy. Like, right. yes, things are bad, right. but we're gonna have grit and whatever. Yeah. And it's sort of the opposite of that. Like the captain before it burns down, I guess the captain starts doing this speech that's kind of a downer and ruins the carnival. Yeah. Right. Like let the yeah. fucking carnival finish. Yep. Right. Yep. You're ruining the carnival. Yeah. You idiot. Um, yeah. And then it burns down. Yeah. And then it's just the failure of this abstract concern that has no consequences because then they just go and they're just going, you yep. know, and that's yep. not even why this other faction happens because yep. the other faction was already there. Like you maybe could make the case that more people went to that faction because of that. But like the, they didn't do that yeah. they didn't sell it so it, does, it feels like i mean there were a couple points in the in the tv show and this was one of them it definitely felt like to me it was perhaps something that happened in the book that made a lot more sense in the book because there was more contextualization to it yeah. and a lot of that stuff was probably not in the show and then you still did the thing i felt like so this by the way is how i felt like watching 
Harry Potter movies is I'm like, none of this makes sense. I'm imagining that most of it maybe made more sense in the book, I hope. But like you cut out a bunch of the things that would have been required for this to make any sense. And so now you're just doing the thing that has to happen now, but I don't know why, right? And this kind of felt like that to me. That might not be what it was, but that's what it felt like. I, I only saw a few Harry Potters. Can I explain right. to you why Harry Potter deeply offends me? I haven't read the books. I've seen okay, a few yeah, of the movies. I've seen some of the movies. It offends me because it is a, a thing. It's, it's a series about magic yeah. where magic is basically about being a script kitty, right? Like <laughs> what you learn in what they somehow spend all year learning in school is that you wave the wand and say the particular words and then the spell happens, right? So it's basically you open the shell and you type the command and that's the magic. You don't, you don't know how to write the program that you're invoking, right? Yeah. You have no freaking idea. Yeah. It's just, you say magicus ignoramus yeah. and the, the thing happens, yes. right? And also there's a sport where if you catch the bird, everything else that every other player did for the whole game is invalidated. That's okay. a bad sport. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Uh, that I take issue with. Okay. I might take issue with both of them, actually. Are both things a terrible idea? Yes. Are they both very accurate to modern society? Yes. So, A, if the magic, if the education system for magic is similar to our education system then in the real exactly world, that's exactly what it is. Exactly yes. what happened. They would never teach you anything about how magic works. They'd just be like, install Perl. And yeah. then you do some stuff. Go to this GitHub page and download it. TensorFlow. Build it after six hours, type some stuff in, right? Yep. That. And then two would be, that's exactly like the weird game design. Like they designed Quidditch originally and it was like you score points by getting the ball on the goal. But then they were like, that's not tense enough because someone could get up like seven to two and now no one has to watch past the commercial breaks anymore. They just turn it off. So like, what if we introduce a golden snitch, which makes it so that you have to watch to the end of the stupid broadcast or whatever, because someone at any time could catch that thing. Okay. Right? I hadn't thought of that angle, the, the commercial like, television yeah. angle. So basically it's just like, it's just designed to make it so that the game sucks, but the audience has to watch. Okay. They should like add a golden snitch to MMA or something like it's running around the edge of the ring. So if you're getting knocked out and you can't really stand up and do a good fight anymore, you like yeah. grab the snitch really fast. Yeah. Right. Also other modification to MMA is everyone has to be in wizard robes for some reason. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was one thing that struck the fire struck me as like the writer's we're just trying to make something happen and it, it didn't Magic make sense art. and it didn't sell it. Another one that really stuck out to me that again, maybe made sense. I'm going to stop saying maybe it made sense in the book. Cause like, I just have to judge it as the show. Yeah, right? I mean, same with so, here. Like maybe all this makes sense in the book. We yeah, have no idea. Audience can apply that caveat globally to everything yep. we say yes. from now on. Um, the whole thing about cutting open the dude's stomach and finding seal meat in there yeah. and like knowing it's seal meat, or even having the idea to do that was completely absurd in the way that it was portrayed in the show, right? Yes. What you could have said is, okay, so so Captain Steubing had the idea to do that, I believe. He said, hey, doctor, cut open his stomach, right? He speaks Eskimo, right? So he could have been like, it's an Eskimo tradition in these parts. Like he, okay, he spoke Eskimo so well that he understood everything yeah. that was being said, yeah, even though in the beginning helpful. they sort of said like, Okay. Oh, I don't know that, but, but he was able he's to have conversations. He's like, he's not fluent, but he's, you know, he's better at Eskimo person. than I am at Spanish. All right. And I took yes. a few years of Spanish in grade school. Um, so, so he, like, you could have sold it as like, it's tradition that Eskimo, when they meet a visitor under friendly circumstances, always give them food and that that would proactively give him an idea. Oh, I can then determine if this was friendly circumstances or not. But that's not what happened. What happened is what? he went up to the guys on the sleds. The, the the dude who got killed went up to the guys on the sleds and they're sort of trying to communicate. And then he asks them for food and they gladly give him some. OK, but if he hadn't asked them for food, that wouldn't have happened. Okay. Right. 
And so why would you think that he would have something in his stomach at all, much less seal meat? Like it doesn't proactively make sense as a thing that you would look for if you were trying to solve a murder. Okay, well, two things. You know what I mean? Well, I'm a little bit less worried about that than you are. And the only reason is because they were very clear to show Captain Steubing getting this idea by having inspected the guy who gave him the seal meat's body and seeing that he was holding the seal meat bag. So I'm assuming that that is what we are meant to believe. But the right. bag was right there on the sled, like, originally. Like, the guy was like, food? And I was like, oh, yeah, I got some seal meat right here. Like, it would have been there yeah. anyway. I don't know. It just, that one bothered me. Well, like, okay. But, of but, of yeah. all the many things on the sled to, like, look at the food bag, which they would have had because they're trekking across a place and saying, I bet he's got seal meat in his stomach it just didn't it, yeah. it didn't well, make sense. Let me but let me say this. So although I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that part because I'm like, well, okay. I mean, yeah, is it maybe not the best? Sure, but is it that far fetched not necessarily at least to me. But here's here's my problem with it separate from that. Number 1 so what? This is not a trial and nobody can nobody got to see that evidence like it's not like they got up in court and had an actual like evidence bag with the seal meat in it he's just he could have said anything and it would have been the same degree of plausibility right like it wasn't evidence he was acting like he needed to provide evidence to the rest of the crew but this is not it's not a context where that makes any sense because it's still just him just saying it. Nobody knows that he actually found the seal meat in there. What if he and the doctor just agreed to lie about it, right? It's not yeah, but, but not in a context where that makes much sense. So this is the first, okay. though, this is the first hostile thing that Hickey did that he knew about, right? The capturing and killing the dog happened before this, but the captain didn't know about that. He just knew the dog was missing, right? Well, and he so, also knew you, that he had him whipped as a boy for sedition. Oh, that was before this, right. Yeah. So that's why he was suspicious that there might yeah. be, yeah. yeah. It still, it didn't work for me the way it, it was. I, I can imagine the, the version that I would have preferred. But right? here, let me just go one further and say the other yeah. reason I didn't like it. The other reason I didn't like it was because I don't fundamentally understand. It's again, it's a lot of writing that doesn't really do what it needs to do. So this isn't a courtroom drama. Like the point of a military command structure is that the captain determines what needs to happen and then you go forward. If you're going to actually court martial someone, that's like a thing. Like you sit down and there's like sides presented and stuff. Yeah. So I didn't really understand what was supposed to be happening. Like if you want to hang somebody and you're hanging someone because you're the captain and you just decided that you're going to, then that's what's going to happen. If you're doing an actual court martial, then I expect to see the court martial. But what happened in this scene was like some weird, I'm presenting evidence on a soap box kind of, but it doesn't matter because the verdict is already that you're guilty and I'm the one who decreed it and we're going to hang you. So it's just, it just, the whole thing didn't feel at all like the thing I was saying I liked about the earlier parts of the show, which is that it felt like you were actually on a boat doing boat things. This felt like random writing. Yeah. Like we just wrote some crap like like from, from Modern Family or something. Like some writer who writes sitcoms came in and wrote the thing down. That like someone's going to say some stuff on a box and then the guy hangs, right? Yeah. Well, and, and also... Oh, sorry. I don't know. Never mind. Keep going. And to add insult to injury, it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter because he doesn't get hung because the beast randomly shows up at this exact moment because they don't want Hickey to hang or something, which, yeah. again, is really lazy writing, right? It's, it's like the Deus whole Ex thing beast. was a giant lazy pile, yeah, this be particular... Beast Ex Machina. Yeah, it was not good. It's Toonbach. Toonbach Ex Machina. Toonbach Ex Machina. Yeah. yeah. I, I have more gripes written down, but they're kind of tiny. Um, okay. We could talk about the ending for a second, because I think, so with the whole Toonbach thing, the ending is kind of ambiguous, right? Yeah. Um, 
in a sense. But what it looked like to me, so, you know, they, they kind of, after all this crap goes down that we're talking about, there was actually one, so they, they fight the Toonbok in the end and, okay, this part doesn't make sense. Let me, let me, this was one of my small gripes, but because we're covering the spoilers that happened yeah. before the well, end. Toonbok right? was my biggest gripe, actually, is just yeah. all the Toonbok stuff I really just didn't like. Well, even the way they bring it down doesn't totally make sense. And just like a lot of other things with the show, there's sort of three things happening and none of them really... Like, he's kind of sick from being poisoned with lead poisoning or maybe forks, right? Yeah. And at the end, he's so sick that he's, like, barely moving and, like, he's trying to eat. And the ant. But kind of barfing him out because he's super sick. And then Captain Steubing, like, drags the chain on his neck for a second on this giant beast. And that, I guess that was, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I guess he's going to try to choke it. And then he stops. And then... I guess guys, my, my read on that was that he died from the poison that all of the dudes had eaten. That's what that, I said. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. That, Cause that chain wasn't going to do anything to that dude yeah. from like, but then at the end he's like, you're letting me stay after what I did to Toonbok. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you like, didn't do Jack. I agree. What are he you talking about? Yeah. But anyway, the thing that, the thing that I thought was really good that fit into the version of the show that I would have liked if it was all this way. Okay is like the Eskimo girl wants to save him and she doesn't understand manacles. Right. So she's yes. like, I've got to cut his hand off to get yes. him out of this thing. Yes, that I was great. Know, like she doesn't know to look for keys, right? Right. That, he was, yeah. that was good. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that he didn't get black botulism poison after that. I was sort of expecting that, but whatever, yeah. you know, she, she put some of the magic ointment on him that she was or doing they just to other people. Him in the fire. Yeah. Anyway. So, so the thing about the ending that I, I kind of thought was interesting, but didn't totally like is that they're sort of also doing this thing where the, the collision of the, the, the sea men, with the Eskimos yes. um, ends up killing both groups, right? Yes. And that is in part why I think the Toonbok is there, even though it's kind of stupid. So okay. like the thing that you kind of notice in the last scenes, right? When, when he finally shows up with Silna at the, like, oh, he's back in Eskimo civilization, right? Right. She brings him there. They sort of do this little debrief or whatever. Yeah. There's some there's like twelve Eskimo tents or something. There's yeah. the people are wary of him. One of the kids goes and hides in a tent, whatever, yes. right? It fast forwards to two years later when the dudes show up. Yeah. There's like six Eskimo tents, right? And that could be maybe the group divided or whatever, yeah. but it's part of this pattern, right? And then after he tells them to, oh, tell them I'm dead and blah blah blah, then it cuts to this thing of him marching, and he's marching with just like a few people that's like I mean, maybe that's his new Eskimo family with his kid, but I don't, I don't think so because I don't think enough time really passed for that. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a thing where like in one of the least emotional shots ever because of the amount of CG, I guess he's like, was going to be trying to be spear fishing, but like froze to death on the ice. But like the kid is alive or something is my interpretation of the scene, but it's so weird because like, I did not get that from it's that. It's like scene he's okay. frozen, he's frozen and matted on and not moving. And they have this thing where the kid like twitches and moves so that you know it's not a still image. But it's also like the camera's pulling out and there's like CG snow and stuff. And it just it looks kind of toonbok fake and weird at the yeah. same time as trying to be dramatic or interesting, right? I guess you could decide that he's like not dead, but I read this as this pattern of okay. I read it as as this pattern of um, the Eskimos are slowly dying out because they don't have enough food because the Toombok used to provide their food like he does, you know, early on, like after after Silna, he brings the seal, he brings her a seal, right? Which is pretty freaking far, like wherever the ocean was, because she was hanging out by the boats at that point. She was right. within walking distance of the boats. So like, right. Somehow he brought a seal to her and she was hungry and ate it. So like there's some amount of food providence that happened that way. That's a good point. Now, I hadn't thought right? about that. 
Yeah. That was my interpretation of that ending. It seemed interesting, but also because I didn't feel this show had that much heart, I didn't, it more felt like a mechanical thing to do to seem profound at the end than something that really mattered. I don't know what you thought. what, What did you think those shots were? I did not. So one of the unfortunate side effects of me significantly disliking the show from the point where they split the party, which was the last three episodes, is that by the time we got to the scene that you're talking about, I was fairly unhappy and was not really interpreting the shots on that level at all. I was just like, okay, the show's over. That's it. Like, I liked the first seven. I didn't like these three. I was not engaged with it on an artistic level at that point at all. So I would, I did not interpret it as anything other than just he, him not wanting to basically revisit all of the horrible stuff that would have happened if he had decided to go back. So he tells them that he died just simply to not have to like face it basically. Like it was just like, yeah, an act but, but of, of, of emotional cowardice. And then I just read that as like, and then that's the end of the movie. It's just him thinking about that. And that's it. I didn't, I didn't actually think that they were trying to tell me information in that shot, but you know, I'd have to go back and watch it. I, I think they were, if you go, if you go watch it with that in mind, you could, yeah, sure. you can let me know sometime if you think that that yeah. makes sense to you. That was my interpretation of the ending. Um, what I did like though, leading up to the end, I, you know, I always have liked things that are nonlinear and discontinuous and where your mind mm-hmm. has to fill in blanks. I agree yeah. that the seagull thing was a little too, like if it was lo- if it was like a David Lynch movie where there was a lot of seagull like things and they kind of connected, like David Lynch does this thing where things kind of connect, but don't totally connect, but yeah. you, you get to think about them and, yeah. and have this activity of trying to, you know, when you're trying to put the puzzle pieces together and they look like they maybe fit, but they don't totally fit. And you're like, okay. oh, it's not that one. That's okay. like what a David Lynch movie does a lot of the time, okay. right? So the seagull wasn't that, but it could have been that. But the part that I liked was when him and Silna are trekking back to Eskimo land and they, they pass the rest of the captain's party, which had tried to go on and like they left these men behind and then they left these men behind. And then he gets to like gold McChain face, who was like the guy who, yep. who he put in command on the beach. Yeah. It was obviously like totally like warlord of the East at that point or something. Yep. Um, I liked the version of the movie that I could fill in in my head of what yes. happened to that party. Right? 100% because agree. Because it was more reasonable and didn't have these flaws that we're talking about. 100% right? agree. Yeah. Um, because ambiguity they're, they're, is very good for me as well. As long as it's not ambiguity of the form, I literally can't think of any way this could have worked. As long as it's like there's multiple things I can think of that would fill in this gap and they're not going to tell me which one it is, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. And honestly, the part where they kill the Toonbok, for example, I actually quite liked the fact that there wasn't some specific magical way this thing died. Like it was just kind of a shit show and maybe it died from the poison, maybe it did. I actually liked that one ambiguous aspect of it i just didn't like anything else about it like i just didn't like the fact that we were having this battle at this point and the fact that we were in this weird like the guy is going to try and feed his time like i didn't really like most of what led up to it but actually i like when things happen and it's not immediately clear like really why they did i'm actually totally on board with that um i just did yeah most of the the back half like the seagull thing didn't feel that way to me right like it felt more just like wait what and not, mm. oh, something happened as a result of the seagull and we're not telling you what it was, you fill it in, right? Yeah. I don't know. I have other gripes about it, but <laughs> I I think I, I hit I hit the major ones, right? Like like every yeah. I mean, I can always complain about the AMC logo for a long time, but So I can't remember if the AMC logo was on it. What did you watch this on? Uh it was just in browser. You know, okay, so I watched so, it on Hulu on the PlayStation 4, and I don't think it had that. Right. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna have to watch stuff that way. It was real. I actually had yeah. to put electrical tape on my screen because it was like this white logo down in the corner, 
I and feel like that would have really aggravated me. There were a lot of dark scenes in the show, you know? Okay. It's a darkly lit show a lot of the yeah. time, and it is super obnoxious. So That Alexa sounds Kincaid horrible, and I, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen for me. Okay. That may have had something to do with why I like this show better <laughs> as well. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my brain's just better at filtering it out. I don't know. I'll, go have, to, I'll have to go look and see um, what happens in Hulu if you do that. Yeah. I don't know. I also just felt like, and I guess I'm elevating a few of my nitpicks to the, a major complaint. Like, and again, I, I think in part, in part it combines with your, with your statement that like, like with the fire that it didn't really matter. It wasn't really like about anything and didn't, Yeah. it was just an event that was stuck in there. Like yeah. the different causes of death that were like hounding these guys were variegated and many of them didn't matter or have meaning right so there was yeah. like there's like random accidents which happen a lot but also had this mystical foreboding like oh this land is cursed or something which is the sort of thing they would say a lot in the beginning right or this land doesn't want us to live right there was yeah, that right, category right, right, right. there was uh but wait, I why guess, is I that guess, bad? I'm not sure I understand what well, is the Well, let me, let me finish with the complaint, right? Because okay. it's not about that one thing. It's about okay. all these things together. Like, okay. There's just like, you know, remember the guy from like episode two or maybe even one who's like hallucinating and sees the Eskimo shaman in the ship? Yes. And then goes crazy. That never goes anywhere, right? No, it doesn't. And so, but that's like, are you supposed to think that that guy right like that how that would guy be, yeah. was going crazy from the lead poisoning botulism that you didn't know about yet maybe except i have to go back and watch but i think that that guy he was kind of a pudgy shaman dude with like face yeah. mask or something yeah yeah i think that was the same eskimo as the pudgy guy who was in the party that hickey first attacked who had the, the party that had the seal meat. And they said later, one of them got away and ran in that direction. Right. But it, that guy never was seen again. I sort of feel like that was supposed to be the same guy, but I don't know. But anyway, that was another way that a guy was dying. Right. Okay. There's the monster just like shredding dudes. Yeah. Tearing them apart. That was another way. There was the monster stealing people's souls. Yes. And, but where they didn't physically die, which was completely unnecessary and happened. And not, they kept bringing it up. Like, and it really happened because you saw really it really happened. happened. You saw it happen. And there were just a number of guys who were just like, you didn't see it happen to them, but they were like vegetables, right? There were two guys who were like eyes open yes. alive, but like there's nothing there, right? Right. Um, so I think that was, they kind of wanted that so that Hickey would have a weird motivation of like, I want to be a supernatural thing tied to eating people's souls or whatever. But right. like, maybe it was like, maybe that's a thing in Aleutian uh, mythology and they wanted to, I don't know, but it like, it didn't like, what, why is this here? Well, this so doesn't... again, this is what, I have the same complaint, right? That I would levy against that particular part. Yeah. Which is that I'm actually 100% okay if you want to have a soul eating beast in your show, but then you need to use that for something. So if you just randomly decide that there's a soul eating beast in the thing, that to me doesn't really, I'm like, okay, fine. That's like really Marvel writing ish to me. Yeah. If instead you were like, okay, the general idea here obviously is that like, you know, if you're, at sea locked in the ice for two years eventually like you will start to be completely crazy in a soulless way as well potentially like lord of the Flies style not i ate too much lead yeah so a fictionalized version of that is a creature that actually eats your soul it's just a metaphor for like what's actually happening to you that could have been interesting like if, if you actually wanted to draw a comparison between what's happening to these sailors as they're locked in the ice for over a year. And they're just like 
losing their humanity. And yeah. the way that you portray that is like a mythical polar bear that eats your soul. Great. Like show me that show and I'll maybe I'll like yeah. it. But that's not what this was. It was just like randomly sometimes the polar bear eats your soul. Yeah. And even right? so it just isn't interesting. Again, it's there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not interesting. So and similarly, like even at the end, right? I, I don't this bot doesn't bother me as much, but it's again, it's it falls into the pattern. Like on its own, it would be fine, but it falls into the pattern. Like at the end, they reveal that Mr. Hickey is not actually Mr. Hickey and was like right. already a crazy psycho who like Everyone stabbed the dude. In the first place. Yes. yes. So like he didn't go crazy from being on the ship. Right. He was just already a psycho, right? He was just already a thief. Yeah. Which I get like objectively, I can't really complain about because that does like if you get a couple hundred dudes together. I think they said 100 at some point was the original crew size or something, but. And, and don't forget Mr. He's motivation for knifing a guy. Was to chill in the Bahamas. Was, to, was like to get to Hawaii or something. Yeah. Yes. That is, he couldn't think of a better way to get to Hawaii. Like than it was literally to get to Hawaii. That's not a joke. That's. And I, I forget like Captain Steubing says, well, you could have just volunteered. I forget what he said. Yeah. About that. But yeah. like, um, which is a pretty bold move considering the fact that you don't know if they're ever going to find the Northwest Passage. You're rolling a pretty big die there. Your only goal is to get to Hawaii. Yeah, and he's supposed to be smart, know. right? So, yeah. like, just go go on one of the ships that's going to Hawaii. There's got to be around, some. Go around, the south, go around the south way. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, so, so uh, objectively, in some sense, that makes sense. But it's, like, it's off theme. It's, like, not that good of an idea to put in your movie or your show if the point is that guys are going crazy from captivity. I mean, it, it's sort of on theme in the sense that like, okay, the, the psychopaths are going to take over and be in positions of power, right? Like that makes sense. That's a thing about humanity, but they like spend so much time on that. Well, and again, and it wasn't interesting because the machinations took over. Like, yeah. this is—I I hate to keep harping on this, but it really is pretty much key to just my like preferences in writing are one hundred percent dictated by this. So, it's just that, look, you've got ten forty-five minute episodes. It's not that much time. Yeah when you're choosing what to put in here, it should be the things that are maximally interesting. Just randomly making this guy a criminal before he came out, just it doesn't have any bearing on the story. And similarly, the fact that he becomes a megalomaniac and like tries to like mutiny and all this other stuff, that's fine, but it's, it becomes about the literal set of steps that he does, which is like a plot heavy thing. And not about the characters anymore. And at that point, I just, I lose interest. Because the plot, yeah. like, again, it's not, it's not a, like, clever science fiction story. The plot itself is not going to sell me on this show. You're not going to, like, have some crazy, interesting plot thing that makes me want to watch it just for that. So it has to be about the interpersonal and character dynamics in order to sell it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess so. The so the question is, do we watch season two of this? <laughs> I get the feeling that you already would watch it, right? Because you like the show enough. I would. I would watch it in the sense that I'd I'd try out the first episode to see if it's similarly well done. I mean, the fact that it's literally unrelated means I don't know that I would expect it to be good because it's not even the same. It's not the same writers. It's not the same anything. Oh, I did, it's that unrelated. Okay, it's completely unrelated. So like. You know, I don't know. Ridley Scott made Blade Runner, and I think it's probably one of my favorite movies. He also executive produced Blade Runner 2049, which is one of my least favorite movies. Yeah. So, like, the fact that he's picking the people in charge doesn't necessarily fill me with any particular... I could go either way. I don't know. Since we talked about Harry Potter and Battlestar Galactica... Can I okay. say one funny thing about Blade Runner? Which one? Which is the original Blade Runner. Okay. Which is, for many years, people who thought they were so smart about computers made fun of the scene where he's he takes the photo, right? Oh, and he's yeah. like, enhance, zoom yeah, in, yeah. pan. And yeah. everyone's like, 
ha ha he's looking at things that weren't in the original scene and like yeah. no we can do for that what we know today yeah you just like back solve the brdfs of all the shit so it's funny that like the thing yeah. the things that people thought were wrong and goofy and that they were so smart about they actually it's dunning kruger right in some sense the dunning kruger of not being far enough in technology well but so. the other thing too is that we actually have that so it's not that you could take the brds they have these papers there's like diffuse and indirect reflection reconstruction papers they yeah, I, I don't know how well that works yet for the kind of scene because it was mostly it, matte surfaces and stuff but like yeah, you can imagine as, it yeah. It's not as good as it was in Blade Runner by any stretch of the imagination, but they are doing it, right? Yeah. Someone in chat says season two looks like a social justice storyline, but who knows? Uh, I, I propose that we do the experiment that each of us watches episode one, and then we decide if that's a thing. Okay. Because like I, for the same reason that you just said, you don't know what the quality is, is going to be better or worse. I also yeah. don't know. Um, yeah. If, if it was exactly like this first season, I would sort of start watching it and see if I happen to like it more because of the setting or the character or better at, like if there were three James McJameses in it instead of one, right. right? That would really make the difference for me. Right. Um, my chat is demanding that I watch the movie, the lighthouse instead. Okay. okay. Well, I can write that down and see what That's it is. Like black and white, like art with a capital a flick. I have not seen it. Um, myself so okay i don't know anything about it anyway See, we can we can decide what the sequel is if we want it i don't know i i feel like i didn't say anything super smart during this discussion but it was fun to hang out and talk about yeah. are, are we actually done is there more that you want to say i feel like i've exhausted what i have to say i don't think so don't because think so. like i said this this show to me was mostly hitting a experiential threshold that made me think that it's a, a recommend. Like I was like, I'm thumbs up on this because I felt like for at least the first seven episodes or so, which is the vast majority of the screen time, right? I mean, yeah. seven to eight episodes out of 10, I really felt like it did a good job capturing that kind of feel. And that's, that gets across my bar of this is, you know, good to watch. It wasn't the kind of show where I was like, oh my God, this is incredibly profound or it's my favorite show ever or it's the worst show ever or anything like that. So I don't have that much to say beyond sort of just the very like literal criticisms we went over. So I think I pretty much got everything. I, I don't think yeah. I have anything. Uh, I, I'm thinking of a random detail. Maybe you know the answer to this. Okay. Okay. How does it make sense? This is very minor, right? Okay, How yeah. does it make sense that that one guy somehow stole James McJames's boots? Do you remember that? They like they make a deal of Captain Steubing looking at the guys when he first shows up in like the Rebel Hickey camp, right? He's yes. Like, he he's at first he's looking with with dismay at some of the people who were there who he thought he trusted, yeah. right? And yeah. one of them is wearing JJ's boots, right? Which yes. which they make a point of showing when they bury him i guess or they at least they put him in a bag i thought they would light him on fire or something at that point right but i don't I maybe they leave him there i can't remember what they did to his body when i saw the boots it was very clear to me that the implication was that this dude stole them off the body yes but, but how but I so i couldn't remember i like didn't remember exactly what the last time I saw the boots was. So I don't yeah. know. I, I so don't know. I have to the weird thing is like, you know, positionally Hickey's party, I believe was supposed to be in front, right? Cause they left first and they were a little bit smaller. And then the, the, the Steubing party was sort of behind and somehow without the Steubing party seeing the Hickey party's trail ever, despite the fact that they were sending out hunting parties and shit, somehow they stayed within like eight miles of each other the whole time, which is in the same way that in sci-fi yeah. movies, nobody writing those ever knows how big space is or how big a planet is. Yeah. yeah, right? yeah. Like in a sci-fi movie, a planet is like one block of San Francisco or something, right? A planet um, is roughly the size of one ice cave so that if, <laughs> if original Spock 
is on the planet, he's he will in the be ice cave. A single ice cave that you can be on in yes. that planet. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that same way, like people don't understand what it's like to trek across land for weeks or months, right? Like it doesn't make any sense. So um, one thing again, I would say it, it, to this, and again, those sorts of complaints to <clears> me just don't matter, especially in a, in a show like this. It would be great if they were all accurate, but it's it's like at that point in the story, there were so many things that I was like, I feel like the writing's kind of lost its way here that I just don't even care about the boots. But what I will say is, again, I do wonder if there's a little bit of the Game of Thronesiness happening there in the sense that this is a book that was presumably condensed in some ways. Yeah, and mean, it's like, maybe they screwed up. Like maybe they were like, Oh crap. We, we condensed we the, the scene part. that made this make sense. And now this guy can't have got the boots and like, we don't, you know, and, and, and they never probably even realized they screwed up. Cause they were just, you yeah. know, like putting things the in. Only, but, like, I if I was going to go watch it again, what I would watch for was, was that guy in the Stubing party until yeah. after they buried JJ well, and then exactly. did he defect and Maybe somehow did, yeah. like that is that is the thing that makes the most sense because um, you know that somebody did that because there's the guy who like double crosses them when he right when he, he the guy who like claims that he found the ocean and leads the captain into the trap or whatever yes that guy obviously was a defector right so maybe there were other i don't know like yeah somehow they I, had to be in so i wasn't clear on if that guy i wasn't clear on if that guy was with the stubing party the whole time or if he somehow snuck in and people didn't real it's oh, too was, small oh, of a group like people would know like before he was like send we need to send a message to our guy in the other party he said that so yeah. he believes at least oh, right that right I'm with them and again this is why i say and and then to sound like a broken record this is why i say i really just don't care is because that's not interesting like this is fundamentally not a show that is succeeding because of the like really intricate sherlock holmes versus professor moriarty antics of the plot like so yeah. It's like that is not the kind of thing that I care about. And the fact that there was so much of that crap happening in the back half, I think, was a real detriment to the show because it was forcing the show to become very procedural in a way that just does not matter. Like, I just all I need to know is that this guy stole the boots off of that guy's body. That's the interesting part. Like, that tells me something about that character. And the reaction of the other characters to him having stolen the boots is what I want to know. I don't give a shit about like who was in which party when or what it's like that just fundamentally doesn't create an interesting narrative and so the fact that we spend so much time on that kind of stuff in the back half was really the part that was a bummer for me and is raising a bunch of issues for you as well because now because you're turning into this very like meticulous procedural show like now you create opportunities to stumble all the time because wait how did that guy see this or they should have been this far away or why were they walking the same direction or how did that guy see this you know all of those things just wouldn't happen if you didn't construct a narrative that required this um us versus them camp story at the end so you know just uh, there's just bad decision all around probably the book's yep. fault for doing that but they could have just not done it i mean i don't know I don't know how many Dan Pattinson fans there were who would be up in arms about the fact that you changed the ending of the terror. Uh, probably not as many as J.K. Rowling army of, of people or whatever, but still. Yeah. Why do people always recommend that I should watch Mr. Robot? I believe that Casey also does not. Literally every day now, somebody says, every time I stream, someone's like, dude, you should watch Mr. Robot. And I'm like, no. I saw season one of Mr. Robot and it, I guess what I would say is if I, if there was a need in the universe for someone to remake Fight Club poorly and for like 10 more hours, yes, I guess they succeeded. But why is that a thing we needed? Like yes, it's super, it, it, messy. there's a bunch of weird plot holes in it. It's like over long. There's it's like, all dude, Fight Club has balls. Okay. And Mr. it was a robot bird. doesn't. And it was first. And it's the and same it was, story. Like, yes. So what the hell? I mean, 
Yeah. So anyone saying I should watch Mr. Robot, you probably haven't seen Fight Club. So go see Fight Club, which will not be as good now that you've seen Mr. Robot. Well, one thing I'll say about Fight Club 2 is not Fight Club 2, but Fight Club 1. There is no Fight Club 2 yet. There will be someday, I'm sure. You know, in the same way they just made Bill and Ted 3 with Bill and Ted being really old, they should make old Edward Norton and Brad Pitt Fight Club. Yes. That would be awesome. Yes. Um. (laughs) And like the Brad Pitt with his shirt off, like... Yeah. But 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 you make him really because Brad Pitt probably still doesn't look that bad compared to right. most dudes. Right, like, yeah. You got to wait another twenty years. Yeah, and give him lots of makeup. Yeah, like, it'll be good. Uh, Fight Club. I watched the entire movie of Fight Club right up until the plot twist, and I did not see it coming at all. Maybe that's just me being slow, but I literally did not see it coming. Somebody Wikipedia linked Fight Club oh. too. Oh, okay. Mr. Robot was so transparent that like I knew in the first five minutes of the show, I'm like, oh, that's not like I, it was not even remotely the same level of uh, of subterfuge or creativity. I thought, but yeah. anyway. Um, and so by the way, Mr. Robot leans on the trope. Oh, the guy's kind of crazy, so we can do all sorts of things. Yes. That's our excuse for everything is yep. the, the character's kind of crazy. So yeah. we can we can decide in the second I don't know if they actually did this because they didn't watch the second season, but like we can yeah, decide I, that that thing in the first season wasn't really that thing because, yeah. you know. I just, didn't watch the second season because it's like the first season wasn't good enough. So I was like, yeah. I'm probably. I, I think I watched the first episode and I was like, yeah, no, this isn't going anywhere. I at first when when I first started watching what I will say about Mr. Robot is like before I actually got, you know, to the end of maybe episode two or something when it was just sort of starting out, I was like, well, maybe it's good because, you know, it looks good. I like Rami Malek. Um, It's a well shot show. I mean, I even uh, like um, uh, uh, (laughs) pump up the volume. Uh, Christmas Slater. Christmas Slater. I mean, I love Heathers. If you want to watch a good movie, go watch yeah, Heathers. Yeah, watch Heathers, guys. I love Heathers. If you've never seen Heathers, watch Heathers. Heathers is, is, is another one of my favorite films. Like, um, especially it's, considering like it's a low budget, more or less. Like, it, I mean, it wasn't low budget, but it was compared to a today's film. You know, it's, it's not a particularly elaborate film, but it's just really well constructed and it's interesting. It's also one of those movies that seems to get remade in much worse versions every 15 years or whatever you know yes. like the yes the group absolutely. of high school girls who are mean right yeah or whatever and the other thing, thing about heathers is that it if you watch it today it seems like it's the the only thing that lets you know it's not about today is that there's not as much like overt pc-ness among the students but other yes. than that it reads exactly like it was made today in terms of how like the school reacts to these things and so on. Um, It's it's like, it's one of those movies that, you know, came from something like the, the writer who isn't even like, I don't think he ever wrote anything else good or anything like just happened upon something that just happens to be true and nailed it. And it's like, you can watch it and you're like, yep. Yeah. That's Although the, the the problem with Heather's, the thing that makes it not as good, Christian Slater is just crazy and you find out at the end and so he does insane things, right? It would be a better movie if like some I don't know, if it if that part was different, I think. Um I don't know if I agree with that. Why is that a problem? Because so if I had to, now that we're going to start talking about Heathers, maybe we need to watch <laughs> I, I haven't seen Heathers in so long. I mean, I've seen it like five times, but the last time was probably 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So it's been a My long, argument for Heathers long. would just be Christian Slater isn't the main character, though. He's yes. supposed to represent that craziness that the main character decides not to go down. So I would not agree with the assessment that him being crazy is somehow bad because he's almost like the devil on your shoulder. Like that's the point. If, if Winona Ryder went, was supposed to be crazy. I agree. That would be a worse movie. Yeah. I, I could see that. 
maybe the next one of these needs to be about Heathers. That's that's the actual. <laughs> we can go watch Heathers and then uh, have a have a debate about whether Christian Slater should or shouldn't be crazy. But there you go. Yes. All right, folks. That was a good three-hour conversation. Minus uh, minus fifteen minutes. That was that was yes. Um, all right. Well, that was like there, four episodes of this show worth of time. That, it's like was, Red Letter yeah. Media, where the thing takes yeah. as long as the show. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Men on Film with <laughs> John and Casey. That could be interpreted quite the wrong way. Well, don't you remember in Living Color? You don't yeah. remember this? There was on in Living Color. I there's literally, that. it's like Men on Film. I don't think and, I saw that. And they were interpreting it the wrong way in that skit as well. Anyway. Yes. We don't have a name for this, and we don't know if we'll do it again, but uh, there you go. The Terror, yeah. the again, terror. if you if you did not catch the beginning of the stream, the, the show we were talking about was called The Terror. It's an anthology show, so season one and season two are completely unrelated. So the one we were talking about was season one. It's on Hulu streaming and maybe somewhere else as well. I, I might have accidentally tweeted that it was Netflix, which is fake news. It is definitely not Netflix. Um, maybe I didn't say that. So thanks yeah. for tuning in and uh, we will see y'all next time. Bye everybody. Bye.